everyone. Um, wow, well, here we go. This has been months in the making, so I'm particularly excited to get this underway. Um, I would like to start with showing my respect and acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land on which this event takes place and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. So I'll start with an introduction um, of myself. So I'm Amanda Mace. I'm a W3C evangelist and, um, and the manager for the new Western Region W3C chapter office, as well as general manager of WebQIT, the host for this chapter. Thank you everyone for coming along both in person and virtually via Zoom. This year has been a year unlike any other, one in which you've all spent far too much time in Zoom rooms, um, more than you probably ever thought possible. So I'm going to keep my bits as short and sweet as I can, so you can hear the really good bits, which of course are our fantastic speakers. So before we sink our teeth into the technical uh, nitty gritty, I'm honored to introduce Alan Bird, who is the global, uh, global business development lead for W3C. He has very kindly offered his time to provide a short welcome from the W3C. Um, over to you, Alan. There we go. Can you hear me okay? So good, good morning to everybody in Australia. It's uh, the evening here in uh, the Boston area of the US. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight or this morning. Uh, W3C has been working with WebKey as a member and as a collaborator for a number of years. So to be able to host our chapter for the Western region of Australia with them uh, is indeed a, an honor for us. Um, if you're here, you probably know who W3C is, but in case you don't, just a brief introduction. Uh, we're the organization that sets the standards and makes the web work. So anytime you type www.anything, you're using W3C standards. We're a member-based organization. We have about 440 members around the globe, uh, but not enough from Australia. So that's why we formed a chapter. We need to have more diversity in the voices and the participation of people from around the globe. And I do that by uh, putting a, net a network of chapters in place. So in Australia, we have three. We have the Western region, we have the Eastern region, and we have the capital region. Um, but today we're really excited to be announcing the Western region. And uh, thank you so much to uh, Vivian and Amanda for all the hard work they've done uh, over the years and over the past couple of months to put this event together for you today. Um, I am, uh, as Amanda said, the Global Business Development Leader, so that means I'm responsible for recruiting members. Uh, and in West, the western part of Australia, that will be Amanda, is, is my local person there who has the title of evangelist. Uh, she works hand in glove with Karen Myers, who you'll hear from shortly. Um, but we we, we grow by participation. W3C has a lot of ways that you can participate as a member. You can be in any of the, any of the 45, 50 working groups and interest groups that we have. As many people as your company want to participate can participate. Uh, we have things that, are, that don't require membership called business groups and, and community groups. Uh, business groups tend to focus on use cases and requirements and uh, community groups tend to be for incubation. A couple of the uh, exciting business groups we have going on right now is one is around web advertising and how to uh, allow uh, privacy protecting web advertising to occur on the web. That's been going fairly strong. We have about 90 organizations involved in that, none from Australia. We need to fix that. Uh, one that we just launched or is a merchant business group. I know there are a lot of merchants in Australia and in fact, one of the chairs for the Merchant Business Group is from Australia. She's from uh, Coles. So uh, again, another place, another new area of work. So the web isn't just a, W3C is not just about the core infrastructure of the web. We talk about it, uh, things that affect industries and Karen will go into that in a much more detail in her presentation, but it could be publishing, it can be payments, it can be transportation, it can be smart cities, another new area for us to start work on. Uh, it can be media and entertainment. Streaming media happens on the web because of the work our members did within W3C. So uh, again, thank you for uh, coming today. Uh, thank you, Amanda, for inviting me. I uh, felt 
it was a reasonable hour and I would rather do this in per I, I, would, I would love to do it in person. I would love to be there in person, but as you mentioned COVID, I'm actually in my home office. I have been here since March the 10th. Those of you that know me know that I don't stay anywhere for six months in a row. So uh, it's been it's been trying to have a trip to uh, Western Australia would have, been a, would have been a plus at this point. But uh, I wish I could have been there in person, but I can't. So uh, I just want to send along my thanks and uh, hope you have a great event. Thanks, Amanda. All right. Well, Next, I'm pleased to introduce Karen Myers. Um, Karen manages W3C membership outreach and recruiting activities in the Americas and, of course, here in Australia. She has been to Australia a number of times, most recently just this past February, pre uh, the pandemic taking hold of the world, of course. It is a pleasure to welcome Karen to tell us more about some of the work that W3C does. Thank you so much, Amanda. Let me see if I can share screen first and then bring up the presentation. So good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure. Okay. Need to share my desktop. Is that showing for everyone? All right, thank you, Brian. I got your thumbs up. <laughs> so um, let's begin. Whoops, why is this not moving? <laughs> I guess I have to click it manually. So there, uh, uh, I would also like to uh, give the acknowledgement, welcome to country, uh, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which all of you are meeting today and we're meeting virtually and to pay my respects to elders past, present, and future. And I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Uh, this is a photo Amanda took of me overlooking the beautiful Perth Harbor, as she said back in February. So again, congratulations to our new uh, chapter in Aust uh, Western Australia region and to Webb Key for hosting and Edith Cowan for hosting in person for today's events. And as Ellen mentioned, W3C's role is the steward of the global web standards. And we have many, many organizations uh, from universities, nonprofits, large corporations, browser vendors, all participating to help advance the work of the web. <clears throat> and of course, the web is built on royalty free standards. And that was a real tenant for uh, Sir Tim when he founded W3C to make sure that the web remains open and interoperable and accessible for everyone. So in order to do that, we have uh, royalty-free standards. So the importance of standards, and these slides will be available so you can uh, spend more time with them later, but we of course are very uh, pro standards in the sense that it really broadens the market for everyone and you have a head start, you get much earlier knowledge of what's going on, what's being developed, what some of the browser vendors are thinking about. Uh, and so you really have a chance to get ahead in not only in the core web standards, but also in specific industries. And of course, royalty free that we make this available means you're also, uh, it's, it's open source, you're, you're not paying any fees, royalty fees. fees. So right now, in terms of W3C's overall uh, strategy and how it delivers on its mission to lead the web to its full potential, our three main areas, expanding core web capabilities, the web for all, and industry vertical application areas. So in terms of the core web, we think about HTML5 and CSS being the foundational elements for the web. And then on top of that, there we go, we are expanding many other areas uh, of core web, web authentication, and you'll hear more about that uh, from Tony and Nadlin today, web RTC, web assembly, web performance, these types of core web technologies. And we're adding more to them, uh, even as we speak this past week, we're adding web uh, GPU for the web and web transport. In the second area, web for all, there are four key areas and we 
also call these horizontal review areas. We review all standards for accessibility uh, conformance, internationalization, all these different languages, privacy and identity, and security. And again, this is the focus of uh, today's webinar and meeting. We'll be hearing more from different speakers on these subjects. So uh, after I speak, Wendy Seltzer will be talking about privacy and many areas in which uh, that is being affected at W3C. As I mentioned, Tony Nadlin will talk about security through web authentication. And uh, Kyle Dunn Hartog will speak about the decentralized, identi and, ah, decentralized identity. And Vivian, of course, accessibility. And my apologies, I did not include David Cook. My sincere apologies. I, uh, he will also be speaking about security and accessibility. So we'll add that in the next version. What I would like to just briefly cover is uh, the industry areas, because many of you are not uh, only in academia or in uh, service-oriented companies or web development companies, but are in application areas for industry. And more recently, we have added several new areas, even since I was in Australia this spring. Uh, we've added smart cities is a new area that's going to launch by the end of the year, an interest group. We're expanding Internet of Things, continuing work with gaming, and the e-commerce area, as Alan mentioned. So we'll highlight just a few of these briefly. So auto and transportation. This is an area that we've been doing for a couple of years, and basically we envision that all of the auto manufacturers, this is our, our vision, will use the same data models for the data coming out of the vehicles, whether they're cars or trucks or other vehicles. And in this way, they, there will be a, a standard API uh, to the cloud, a data model for the various elements. We already have ontologies for over 800 elements coming out of uh, the car, like signal information or check engine light, et cetera. Uh, and then there'll be a standard API to the cloud so that there will be more services and shared data for weather reports and uh, traffic delays, things of this nature. So it's a very exciting group. And even accessibility. There's a, a group that's also working on transportation accessibility descriptions. The smart cities, this is going to also look at data models and ontologies and other use cases. We're very open to seeing what's going to happen here. We will, of course, liaise with ISO since they have a very strong initiative around smart cities, as well as many other uh, cities and states and countries uh, around the globe. Media and entertainment. So this is a very exciting area. It's been going on for over a dozen years. Uh, as Alan mentioned before, we, we're the folks that have brought you streaming media, so you no longer have to put a plug in to watch a video on the web. And we're continuing to do a lot of work here to enhance uh, what commercial media, as well as other media players, are interested in. And we're very honored that uh, last year we received an Emmy Award, a technical Emmy, for our uh, standardization of a full streaming uh, experience on the web. And three years before that, we had also received an Emmy for TTML, Time Text Markup Language, which makes uh, video accessible and with captioning and subtitles. So what was pretty interesting is uh, when Disney launched its Disney Plus, it did so using web tech, W3C web technologies. And people sometimes ask us, well, is there a commercial application here? Absolutely, 10 million signups uh, after one day. That was pretty impressive. And that was all royalty free, right? <laughs> it doesn't mean they didn't do work. It just means they're using standards royalty free. So the next area, e-commerce on the web, uh, the blue uh, boxes are already uh, activities that are on the standards track. The green are business groups, which are looking more at business uh, needs and requirements. And then the uh, orange, sort of orange color, red color is uh, incubation or community groups, which are free. So there's many different areas that you can get involved with uh, in the e-commerce section. 
improving web advertising. I'm certain that Wendy will uh, be bringing up this in greater detail because she is leading this group with many, many uh, diverse folks from the browser vendors, ad tech, uh, advertisers, brands, really interesting community that is looking to improve the web platform with uh, a, a really a new model because Google announced that they are going to be discontinuing cookies uh, in the next year, year and a half. And so there are going to be a lot of different changes that will be required. So uh, this is a wonderful group. I encourage you to, uh, to join that and you'll hear more about that. Web payments. Again, this is a, uh, we're trying to have merchants be able to reach more customers and streamline the checkout experience, particularly on the mobile. When you think about all of the different um, application or all the different literally applications that you fill out to make that happen when you're trying to buy something and there's a very high shopping cart abandonment rate as a result and so this is one of the goals of this group is to make web payment much more seamless on the web and many people say to us well why why not just go to the the merchants app well customers are getting tired of apps because there are so many now to download and many would just prefer to go right to the website uh, where it's ubiquitous. So progressive web apps are a native like experience. And so we are seeing a number of companies that are using progressive web apps because it takes up far less uh, space and they're very efficient. For example, 0.4% the size of the iOS app for what Starbucks is using with their progressive web app for payment and they're seeing great results. And of course, the new merchant business group that Ellen mentioned. And so what we heard is that for some uh, companies, the technical work is maybe more than they would like to commit to or they would really like to focus on uh, integrating some of the web technologies into their businesses and better understanding them. And so this new forum will not be a technical forum. They will really be discussing all of these challenges that merchants have along with others in the ecosystem from banks to uh, platform providers, et cetera. So we expect that customer interaction uh, will be very high on the list of merchants uh, improving their web experiences course payments, which we spoke about, accessibility. We've seen a number of merchants uh, have to really work harder to make their websites accessible in this uh, uh, post-COVID environment. Privacy, security, and of course, improving mobile. And again, uh, I think I did see that uh, we have the Coles representative, Melanie O'Brien, will be one of the co-chairs from Coles for this group. So we're delighted. Thank you for your leadership here. Publishing, this is another wonderful area at W3C. And we know there are many uh, publishing, independent publishers in Australia, as well as university publishers. And also companies are using uh, web technologies like EPUB to publish content. And EPUB is a much more accessible format than other formats. We have just launched this month, in fact, last Friday, they had the kickoff uh, call for an EPUB working group. Now, while EPUB was originated by the International Digital Publishing Forum, the EPUB, uh, the forum merged with W3C a couple of years ago, and a community group has been working on specifications and has brought this forward now to be standardized. So we're very excited. And if you're interested in more about publishing, I have the link here for the webinar we held just in uh, July, the end of July, which gives you an update on the working group, the business group, and the community group. So there's many ways to get involved in the publishing area. So uh, how to participate? Uh, I, the community groups are free, uh, and we really hope that you will continue to participate in educational and networking events, such as this uh, launch event that WebKey is hosting as the Western Region chapter for Australia. And you can join public mailing lists. Those are free and you can follow the various work and activities. 
Um, business groups do have a small fee, but you can join those or choose to step up and become members and have a seat at the global community table. So come join us and we hope this is the first of many uh, wonderful webinars and engagements and hopefully in-person meetings in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Are there any questions for Karen? If maybe you could either raise your hand in the Zoom or anyone in the room with questions for Karen? No, not in the room, um, physically anyway. Anyone in the Zoom room? Okay, I think that's it. Thank you, Karen. Thanks for having me. So up next, we have um, Wendy Scheltzer, who is also based in America. We are definitely um, getting the North Americans in today, aren't we? Including my own accent. Uh, so Wendy is a lawyer and a technologist who leads the W3C strategy team, and she's going to be speaking to us about web privacy. So um, whenever you're ready, Wendy. Let's see. Thank you. So uh, it's a pleasure to, to be with you and uh, I, I join you in uh, my thanks to, to the community, uh, both the ancestral community and those present uh, today uh, for, uh, your, uh, for the opportunity to uh, share with you. And um, I'm going to uh, encourage you to think about how the web needs you uh, and needs your help in uh, privacy engineering and standards. Uh, this is a topic that uh, I think uh, all of us um, have become increasingly uh, aware of. Um, see if I can get this little Twitter uh, post to show uh, that this is a, a GIF uh, showing uh, somebody's uh, rendition of the experience of using the web today. Um, as you travel through a website, uh, you may recognize the American movie Airplane, uh, encountering not uh, disruptive uh, participants in the uh, airline terminal, remember those, uh, but rather all of the ads and uh, blockers and pop-up requests that you turn on cookies and turn on uh, access to give permission for access to information. Uh, well, all of those uh, requests that you're getting there uh, are the product of, you know, well-intentioned design decisions that we th think users should be given choice and control over their uh, cookie access and uh, what they see on websites. Um, but, uh, Together, uh, so far, they've produced sort of a, uh, a confusion of, uh, of prompts and uh, taken to its extreme, this leads users to install ad blockers or uh, even turn away from the web to other technologies. Um, well, if you don't, uh, and uh, as Karen mentioned, we're addressing some of that in the Improving Web Advertising uh, group, which I will come to uh, toward the end. Um, but say you're not concerned about uh, ads and commercial privacy, um, you might instead be concerned about government uh, spying. So the smiling face here was from one of the uh, presentations that Ed Snowden uh, revealed on NSA's PRISM program, uh, NSA in cooperation with uh, others of the five eyes, uh, using uh, access to uh, corporate data networks to uh, snoop on traffic, including traffic uh, shared by uh, advertising identifiers that would help them to follow uh, individuals uh, around on the web. And it's not just the, uh, the US government, uh, China has uh, deployed some cartoon police officers watching users to uh, de deter them from visiting censored sites. Um, and it's not just uh, police officers, that's uh, well-meaning camp counselors back when we had uh, summer camps who uh, offered parents photo recognition for their campers and uh, follow them around, uh, taking photographs, automatically recognizing them and sending them home. Uh, to, uh, that may seem all well and good for uh, the happy smiling camper, uh, here, uh, but what about uh, facial recognition deployed in the 
hands of the, the state. Uh, this was uh, a Ningbo crosswalk camera that would capture faces as people were jaywalking, uh, allegedly. Uh, unfortunately, this particular instance was not a uh, an executive jaywalking, uh, but rather her advertised uh, image on the side of a bus crossing in front of the crosswalk that uh, was recognized as uh, jaywalking, shamed up on the, the, the public LED uh, screens in the sh uh, square uh, until uh, it was pointed out that in fact uh, she was uh, nowhere near the, the, the scene and the bus was uh, rolling through as, as intended. Uh, so how do we think about privacy in respect of all of these different potential intrusions. And of course, that's just a small slice of the, the ways that we see uh, our uh, privacy uh, intruded upon. And I think we need to think broadly about how we respect users and, and their variety of ends and uses. Uh, so I wanna give uh, a couple of, sort of background um, perspectives taking from uh, political philosophy and sociology uh, before coming back to the, the web technologies and how we respond. Um, so among the, the thinking about how we uh, deal with privacy, I think to Michael Walzer, uh, whose spheres, spheres of justice uh, suggests that justice depends on separation of power among social spheres, how much money you have shouldn't determine how much voice you have in a political election, uh, or your uh, ability to get an education or uh, your position in a religious community. Privacy is one of the forces that enables us to maintain those distinct spheres. It lets us take a persona in one place and have distinct interactions. Uh, Helen Nissenbaum takes that concept further uh, in thinking about privacy as contextual integrity. Privacy, she says, uh, is part of the ability to control information flows. What you tell your doctor uh, is something that even if you know your doctor in a social context as well, she shouldn't come up to you at a cocktail party uh, and ask you, so how's that knee feeling and the heart? Uh, those are different contexts and different interactions uh, are appropriate there. Uh, Irving Goffman, uh, sociologist, uh, further talks about the, the performative identity and the option to, the opportunities to build identity by taking time off stage. You have the identities that you project uh, in public and build those by uh, thinking, reflecting, at, at, without being seen uh, at every moment. The opportunity to take those deliberations in private uh, is part of what helps us to, to build and strengthen uh, our social uh, personas. Privacy isn't always just about concealment though. Uh, Zainab Tufeci uh, also uh, notes that an important quality for protest and part uh, and participants in uh, mo social movements can be the ability to verify who they are and that they were there uh, and present at the scene of an event that they're recording. Uh, so privacy isn't only about concealment, uh, it's also about, uh, and you'll hear uh, authentication and uh, identity, uh, these aren't uh, from, from our uh, later speakers. These aren't inconsistent with privacy. They're all part of what uh, users, people using the web uh, are trying to achieve. And we need to think about all of these uh, multiple users and use cases uh, as we think about designing technologies. Um, so how do we do this on the web? Uh, I love this uh, drawing from Paul Downey, uh, the web is agreement. You know, uh, people build technologies that work together and the web depends on uh, those uh, interoperable uh, technologies and the standards uh, that help to build uh, interoperability. We work uh, as a voluntary consensus standards organization by finding places that people can agree and places where uh, updates to the technology can improve the situation for everybody. Uh, so uh, we look at um, 
uh, standards for you know, shared technical problems, uh, a good enough technical solution, uh, and uh, ecosystem interest in common resolution. And uh, we do that against the background of, of the, the web paradigm uh, where you know, origin-based security, uh, that the, the web, uh, web page is sort of in, in control uh, or the, uh, of the, the user uh, experience and uh, shouldn't be sharing information with other uh, sites without uh, user uh, expectations and understanding. Uh, the HTML design principles include the uh, priority of constituencies, putting the, the user uh, first, more recently that the tag has produced uh, ethical web principles that uh, art articulate more of, of these values. Um, and uh, the, the privacy interest group and the tag, the technical architecture group uh, have together uh, put together uh, this security uh, and privacy uh, self-review questionnaire. Um, and uh, so um, we're to, to take us through uh, an example from, uh, from that, uh, the, the, the challenge of website finger, web browser fingerprinting. Uh, so the self-review questionnaire asks, uh, what information from the underlying platform, such as configuration data, uh, is exposed by this specification to an origin? Uh, so this questionnaire is designed to be used uh, in the process of uh, review by uh, specification uh, working groups that are uh, working on designing specifications, uh, as well as uh, then by uh, privacy experts in the, the, the privacy interest group and uh, broader W3C community, looking to make sure that every specification uh, that we're writing uh, and recommending to the world has privacy considerations uh, built in. Uh, it's, so through, through a series of questions, uh, including this one, we're asking spec authors and, and, uh, and would-be implementers and users uh, to, to consider uh, the, the impact. Uh, so what information um, is exposed? Um, use examples uh, might be uh, the user agent, a listing of fonts of available to the, the user agent, plugins, uh, attached devices and sensors, for example, for immersive web. Uh, it might be important to know, does the user have a headset or does the user have navigation uh, devices that the, the website can uh, ask them to interact with? Um, and so th there might be good reasons to ask for lots of these uh, pieces of information, but the privacy challenge uh, is that lower entropy, the more unique bits of information shared about uh, a web browser setup, um, the more likely uh, the, that uh, setup uniquely identifies uh, or fingerprints uh, a user. Uh, and that lower entropy or fingerprint uh, increases the linkability from uh, use to, to use. Uh, it enables uh, cookie-less tracking. It enables uh, multiple different origins, distinct uh, web sites and properties uh, to recognize that the same user or at least the same user configuration uh, has interacted with each of them. Uh, that could be a crossing of the contexts uh, in Helen Nissenbaum's language, uh, a, an intrusion onto uh, user expectations of uh, who knows what about them, um, a linking of, uh, of activities that the user might deem uh, to be distinct parts of their uh, life, a work profile, a home profile, um, as well as uh, things that they might prefer to keep uh, confidential like medical interactions. Um, so the security uh, questionnaire uh, doesn't tell us uh, the answer. Uh, it tells us to evaluate the, the trade-offs and you know, we look at something that's uh, increasing fingerprinting surface area and ask, can we fix it? You know, can, can we reduce that 
uh, additional surface area without breaking functionality or performance while respecting the user's time and preferences without displacing user activity to a different platform. Uh, and each of these is, you know, a, a, a question that we, you know, think through, invite our community to think through um, and you know, reason about to, to come to understanding of, is this good for the platform? Is this new feature worth the costs? Um, and we might look at um, aspects uh, like the passive or active availability of the information. Uh, does it require the website to do something specific? Uh, in which case, uh, Third parties and outside researchers can track whether websites are querying this API, finding the information, and whether that, you know, is it only immersive uh, web, uh, immersive sites that are asking about heads up displays, um, or are unrelated sites asking that information, uh, making it more likely that. Uh, it's for a, a fingerprinting purpose. Uh, graceful degradation. Is, is there a fallback if this feature is not available or if a user declines to provide some of the information that a site requests? Uh, error compatibility, looking that to uh, that multiple browsers would respond in the same way to uh, an error condition helps uh, users to uh, be less identified in uh, in the particular uh, use case. Uh, privacy debt, are we building up uh, an accumulation of features, each one adding a little bit to uh, our privacy and linkability challenges that make it harder to change the platform overall? And, um, and pr protecting the individual and the crowd. So sometimes uh, individuals selecting more privacy preserving settings, uh, in fact, help make themselves stand out more uh, among uh, other uh, users because there aren't too many people who have selected that particular uh, configuration. So how do we design a suite of configurations such that privacy sensitive users have choices that help to keep them private uh, and that users who may not have walked through all of the menus also have uh, the right uh, options and uh, pr privacy as, uh, as is their right and expectation. And um, so, uh, that was really a, a, a very brief run through of uh, some of the ways that we think about privacy at, at W3C. And um, I wanted to share a, a few links um, here at the end to uh, places that these are being talked about. Um, we have the, the privacy interest group, um, several uh, different pieces of documentation uh, that they've worked on, uh, the tag and their ethical web principles. Uh, Privacy Community Group uh, is a recently formed group that's doing uh, incubation of new features uh, for uh, privacy protection and um, taking ideas from uh, users and implementers together and uh, specking them out to the point where we can say, is this a good idea that should be recommended for uh, standardization on the web platform? Do we have interest from multiple places around the web that this would be uh, a feature worth uh, offering? Um, we have things like storage isolation um, under consideration there, um, or some click measurement, private click measurement, uh, new features that that would you know, offer different levers and, and different trade-offs uh, for thinking about uh, the, the web's uh, feature set. Uh, the Improving Web Advertising uh, Business Group, as I mentioned, uh, is looking at you know, uh, what can, can we do to improve the web as a platform that is both uh, monetizable by uh, publishers and authors, independents and, uh, and, and companies uh, sponsored, um, and private. Uh, 
advertising to date has relied on lots of those uh, identifications through cookies and fingerprinting and uh, building profiles and things that uh, users might find uh, creepy. Um, how can we improve the privacy there and also improve the opportunities for um, marketers to reach their audiences and for publishers to sell advertising space to finance uh, the content that uh, they're producing, journalism or entertainment? Uh, how do we do all of that in a way that you know, help that the web browser can represent to the user is uh, serving user interests. Uh, the Improving Web Advertising Business Group is looking at sort of rebuilding some of the features of uh, that that have served uh, advertisers, uh, including what happens when uh, third-party cookies um, be become unavailable, and. Uh, and some of that involves building privacy preserving measurement alternatives. Uh, so uh, building, for instance, uh, a separation between uh, the measurement of a click and its attribution to a conversion event, uh, noticing that the user clicked on an ad and made a purchase on the website uh, using uh, techniques like differential privacy uh, to help report aggregate information to uh, the advertisers without um, reporting on every individual who clicked the ad, preserving the context, uh, in contextual integrity for the users and preserving the monetization ability for uh, the advertisers uh, and publishers. Um, and you'll hear from, uh, from some of our other um, Participants then about um, activity and uh, web authentication. Uh, Tony Nadalin, who will be speaking to you, is one of the co-chairs uh, of that group. And, uh, and uh, the Web App Sec, the Web Application Security Working Group, um, is our sort of uh, umbrella group for a lot of the uh, security techniques of uh, of, of the web platform. How does uh, a browser Keep us keep sites isolated uh, out by, for example, uh, protecting users against mixed content and uh, managing the HTTPS upgrade path, um, and uh, so lots of the tools that app web application developers use to ensure uh, both the privacy and the security uh, of their users uh, are tools that are being built. Uh, in web app sec. Uh, and so if any of those things interest you or any of the other things that I, I've said, uh, I hope you'll join us in uh, some of W3C's privacy work. And uh, here uh, are some of the different ways that you can get in touch with us and get in touch with me directly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. But there's a lot of information in there. So I'm going to open up the question. Um, Start with the people physically in the room. Does anyone physically? Yeah, Greg. So Greg, oh, I may have to repeat it for people on Zoom. You don't have a microphone. Okay, so I'm going to repeat that for the room. So Greg, correct me if I get any of this wrong. So Greg is asking the, the trade-off between convenience and privacy. Uh, so for example, um, download an application that allows you to tag photos of a friend, um, and then that um, information is out there. But usually when you download, you have to take it and read the Privacy Act, whether you do or not completely um, irrelevant. We know no one does. Um, does that mean then that you've given over, um, that you've given over all privacy because you've ticked that little box? 
um, well, th this is where you know te technology interacts with uh, regulation and uh, legal and regulatory contexts. Uh, so te technology can uh, enable uh, ver various permission prompts. It can also enable sort of data segregation in the uh, in the places to which you're providing uh, data. So we're you know, learning more about new te about techniques of multi-party computation that enable uh, the calculation of you know, uh, who's in without necessarily showing the image um, broadly. Um, so all of these you know, are things with technology can enable uh, us to, to to improve privacy, um, and then you know often we require. Um, either market pressures, demand for privacy, uh, asking companies to, to, to take those uh, concerns into account, um, or you know, regulatory enforcement uh, that uh, limits the, the uses or uh, onward processing and sharing uh, of data. Does that answer your question, Greg? Yeah. Yes, it does. Is there anyone in the Zoom room who has a question? Okay, I'm just gonna follow that up, Wendy. I'm just wondering from an accessibility point of view, we talk a lot about plain English and I'm finding, I have customers now who are um, looking for ways to provide privacy terms and conditions um, in a plain English way. Is that potentially a way forward to make sure people understand what they are giving up when they, you know, what the trade-off is? I think that that's that's a piece of it. Um, helping, you know, ma making the the language understandable, and you know, recognizing the, the the cognitive burden that people are on when they're asked to make privacy decisions um, is both a matter of accessibility, but a matter of accessibility for for everyone, uh, because often these prompts come up when. You're, you as a, a user are trying to do something. You're trying to make a purchase or trying to find information. You're not trying to analyze all of the ways in which your information will be used uh, based on that transaction. And so this pop-up is getting in your way. There's a great incentive just to click, okay, I agree, further because you don't have much choice about it. You know, you, you, If you want the product, if you want the information, um, you you have to click, uh, so uh, there's there, there's good work to do both in explaining it uh, further uh, and in in make ensuring that uh, the the users have real choice uh, about how to respond there, and for, for for third parties to 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 be watching and uh, and helping users to evaluate their options and uh, reclaim that choice. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Unless there are any other questions. Thank you very much, Wendy. Uh, so strong authentication. We actually, Wendy touched on it, um, but she's left the, the hard work to Tony. So uh, Tony is joining us also via Zoom and also from America. And that's what he's going to talk to us about. So Tony is an accomplished author with 85 patents issued, which makes me feel under accomplished as an adult. He is also considered a pioneer and thought leader with a career emphasis in security and the identity space. Tony, it's all yours. Take it away when you're ready. Can you see the screen? Sorry. Go. There we go. Okay. It's a show through now. Yep. We're good. Okay. Um, I'm Tony Nadlin and I'm the co-chair along with um, John Fontana for the W3C web Authn working group. We've been going on for a few years now, um, but we have been making good progress. Uh, so I'd like to take you through what the web Authn working group is actually doing. Um, so as I'm going to skip this slide because we all know what the W3C does here. Um, but why authentication is, you know, the cybersecurity priority one is, you know, poor authentication mechanisms have been exploited over the years. Um, 
and attacked and stuff. And one of the major attacks that happens is the servers get attacked um, because the servers are where. Through. We can only see you. So you just need oh. your screen isn't happening. How oh, is that? Is that okay? Maybe I didn't do this right. No, that's not it. So I said presentation, share screen. Okay, is that it now? Um, oh, there we go. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay, we're good to go now. Okay. Um, so basically, the servers wind up getting attacked because that's where the passwords wind up getting stored. And of course, you know, a lot of these merchant sites aren't the best security. You know, they don't have security, proper security people and stuff, and they tend to store the passwords unencrypted or just hashed. And, you know, it's offline attacks and you can wind up getting the passwords. And then what happens is the people that get passwords then look for user IDs and stuff on other systems. And usually people use the same passwords on multiple systems. And so you can see the, the train wreck happening here as far as pass accounts getting attacked. And let's face it, account attacks are very costly. Um, and so a lot of the vendors, the large vendors that have bought into going, trying to get rid of passwords, such as Microsoft, Google, um, you know, Apple and stuff have, you know, account theft costs them, you know, between 100 and 300 dollars to wind up for each call they get on an account tax. So this adds up very quickly and trying to get a, an account back is even more costly than just taking the one to $300 phone call over, over this. Um, and so something has to been, something has to be done as far as the passwords are concerned. So this effort got started, at least from my perspective, um, got started back in 2014 and it's, now 2020, so it's been a five year, you know, a little bit over a five year journey for me to try to eliminate passwords. Um, so today's passwords, you know, get reused, they get fished, and they get key logged. You know, everyone's sure everybody's gotten key logged at one point. You know, they click on a website and it loads stuff into the browser, and then they wind up getting all their passwords key logged and sent back to whomever is doing the key logging stuff. Um, and so today's alternative passwords are SMS. Um, and we all know how that goes, right? It's got issues as far as um, coverage, delay, cost. You know, it costs every, somebody a bunch of money every time they send an SMS text message. You know, somebody's paying for this. Um, either you know, both the sender and the receiver are paying for this. Um, the device usability is not always um, good with one-time you know codes or SMS devices. Uh, user experience is you know you get this pop-up all the time and wondering is this really you know a valid SMS request or somebody trying to fish me? And you know, as the last one says, you know they're still fishable. So these are not very good alternatives today. So the major industry ten trend here is to, um, you know, to try to carry, you know, people carry personal devices, right? They carry their laptops and they carry their phones and they carry, you know, different things with them. And so, um, you know, we're looking at, you know, pin patterns, you know, uh, you know, your credit cards these days have pins and um, other things, have, you know, your phone now is locked with a pin and stuff. So trying to utilize some of these major industry trends to eliminate um, passwords. And um, let me see. And um, is it showing in full screen or is it in my notes section here? not full screen but we can see the slides oh no sorry is that better that's screen, yep oh sorry about that you should have okay um should have said something earlier okay so um 
So putting it together, so the trend is, you know, we're heading towards this stronger local device authentication. Um, you know, credit cards are moving towards this, this aspect, right? They've got, you know, pin protection these days, most of them do. Um, and so this is the core, I, core idea behind the W3C standard um, that we've been working on. And so the web authentic experience here is pretty easy, right? You get a, um, you get a transaction and such as a log on and you show a biometric, it could be a biometric, could be a pin um, and then you're done, right? So this is all in the password, passwordless experience. And so we have this notion of um, external authenticators or built-in authenticators. In most laptops today, there is either a TPM chip or uh, a or secure execution environment or something that's um, got some security behind it. And this is where the cryptography is actually done in, as far as the um, authentication is concerned. And some devices have biometrics, right? We have Face ID, we have um, Windows Hello, we have um, Google has the same situation with a fingerprint. And so this is all look, this is all hooked into the authentication. So the biometric is meant to be a way to unlock the authenticator. Um, and so once you touch your biometric, it authentic, you know, the biometrics are done locally. So no biometric information goes over the wire. You're authenticated to your device locally. The cryptographic material is generated and then the cryptographic material is sent over the web. And this is all done through JavaScript APIs. And this is what WebAuthn is all about. Um, and so down below you can see the, um, also that we have a second factor experience. So if you're not, you know, if you wanna do a migration path and you're not sure that you really want to get rid of passwords, we do offer um, as part of WebAuthn is a second um, factor. So you can log on with your normal password, then you would insert your dongle or your or use your um, built-in authenticator, and you would go ahead and do your biometrics or press a button or you know presence button, and then you're done. So it gives you the somewhat the same. Um, feeling as pass, you know, passwordless experience, except you know, you're using your, pass, your existing passwords to log on, but you need this second factor. So that was, um, you know, a lot of people started out with the, first, with the second factor experience and now have gone pretty much to the passwordless um, experience. And that's what we're trying for is, you know, the password experience. And as far as we had to allow the second factor for migration purposes, for easy migration of, people that weren't quite comfortable with just eliminating the password altogether. Um, so what have we done so far? Um, did I get something, hold on. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, what have we done so far? So we have um, November 15th is when um, the FIDO, the FAST Online Identity Organization, submitted um, specifications over to the W3C for um, for consideration. And then in February, the WebAuthn Working Group was formed, February 6, 2016. And then as far as um, W3C candidate recommendation, we happened in March 2018. And then in, two and then in November 2018, we started to see deployments um, of various browsers. And this is um, browsers as far as, um, you know, Chrome is concerned, Edge is concerned, Firefox is concerned, and some of the um, mobile browsers were concerned. Um, and our intent was to get all the browser platforms out there. Um, and then in March 2019, we went to recommendations. So, the, so level one is a final specification. We are now working on um, level two. Um, which is a add-on, which is a follow-on to level one, which helps us um, fix some of the bugs and add features that people saw missing. And we're well into level two right now. Um, I do expect that we finish sometime this year. Um, so as far as the privacy and security design here is, 
you know, no third, there's no third party in the protocol. Um, so there's no middleman here that you're storing passwords with and things like that, right? Uh, I, there's a lot of these password managers out there that involve third parties that, you know, they'll, they'll help you, right? They screen scrape and they will refill in your passwords for you. But, you know, once again, it's a third party involved here. Um, there's no secrets on the server side. So if the, sec if the server side gets broken into, right, there's no secrets. This is all cryptographic. Your private key is actually, this is uses private public key technology and the private key is stored on your authenticator, which is in your possession. So there's no secrets that ever leave the device itself. And so if somebody hacks into the server, they can't do anything because there's no information over on the, on the server side except the public key. And everybody, you know, you can have a public key and you know, there's been many attempts to, you know, hack at the, so at the public key side. So um, if there's every biometric data that's used to unlock the authenticator, it stays on the device itself. This is not remote biometrics by any chance. So all the biometric matching and templates are stored on the device, on the, what we call the authenticator themselves. There's no linkability between services. That is, you can't figure, you can't find out where you've been based upon, um, you know, using your authenticator. And there's no linkability between accounts as far as, um, uh, as far as using your, using your authenticator is concerned. Um, so the summary of W3C today is, you know, we have the final spec level approved. It's a standard. First browsers are shipping now. Um, you know, we have live deployments. We're, we have great momentum going into 2020. We actually have all the browser vendors now behind us. Apple has been active in getting Safari um, out the door and, and iOS also, as far as um, web authentic is concerned. So we're well into way of, of making great progress. And um, level two, as I said, is under, under development. Um, and so we expect that to be done by the end of the year, hopefully if everything goes okay. Um, so how it works is basically we have a registration, right? We have um, a site that you go to, right? Everybody goes to various websites, could be your bank, could be anything. Um, and as part of this, they would click on, the, um, you know, you click on fight. You would click on the, on using WebAuthn as your authentication mechanism, and basically what happens is there is a protocol that goes back and forth for user. There's a JavaScript API that's contained in the link on the website, on the relying party's website. That JavaScript gets loaded down to your browser. That JavaScript is executed, and part of it is the JavaScript APIs that the WebAuthn community, you know, our working group has defined. And this goes through a registration process that generates the private key on the authenticator, sends and then sends the public key over to the relying party site. The relying party site registers that um, public key, and now I have a link between the you between the um, authenticator and the uh, relying party. And so when I come back to that particular site, they can look up the public key that belongs to me and then I can go ahead and um, authenticate. So, and basically this is how the login works. I go back, you know, I press on, I want to log in. The site says, okay, I'm using, I'm using WebAuthn. Okay, let me look up, try to find the authentic, try to find the, public key is associated with me on the authenticator. I find it, I generate the challenge and I send it back to the server for verification. And now I'm logged in. And so, um, you know, this is an ongoing, every time you go back, it will look up that same pub, it will look up that same public key that got registered with that website. And so when somebody breaks into the server site, all they get is that um, public key. They don't get any private key information. Um, and so we decouple um, from we decouple the the local authentication modality from the authentic, from the authentication protocol itself. 
And so this is something that, you know, we go, we go through and we don't, we're not doing identity here. We're doing authentication. And so it's, when I do the registration, it's up to the website itself, the, the relying party, um, to do, actually do the, the identity verification and create an identity for that person. WebAuthn does not do that. WebAuthn is strictly an authentication protocol, and it's up to the relying party to, to do the linkage between that authentication that's actually happening to an identity which is in the registry of the relying party. And, um, you know, this is part of what went on with FIDO as far as they were concerned, because these are, FIDO is actually the organization that um, requested, you know, had started all this um, password list stuff, um, but they didn't have, they weren't a standards body and they needed a, they needed all the browser vendors to, to buy into this, right? They needed a built-in API. They needed a web platform for all the, you know, Android, iOS, Windows, et cetera. Um, and the only way they could get that was through the W3C. And so this is why the partnership was um, formed. And what was missing from why FIDO could not do this themselves is they needed a client side and they tried to distribute a client side application and it, we all know how that works and not all, you know, you have to write one to every platform. You have to, you know, have, you have to be able to distribute those and, you know, it's just a total mess on how client side, you know, applications work today. And so the easiest way to distribute this was through the browser and have this API built into the browser. Um, and so how platform support helped us in here, accelerated adoptions, you know, it allowed an RP to develop a very standard way to write the JavaScript and to deliver that JavaScript to the browsers and for the end user devices. And so this gave them a standard way, no matter what browser they were, no matter what browser they were delivering it to, it is the same JavaScript. Okay, you may see some differences in platforms of how they implemented the interfaces, but the JavaScript works ubiquitously across all these browsers that we um, that we have. So you can think, you know, way back when TCP/IP was being developed back in the um, you know early PC days, and you had to get a stack, a TCP/IP stack, and God, everybody's TCP/IP stack was. Um, different, you know, Win95 Win had a different one and Mac OS had a different one and, and it was just not a good thing. So this is why we chose the, you know, W3C is the perfect place to do this work. Um, so what's going on in, in W3C? So we've, you know, finished the, finished the first version. Um, we do platform tests, um, you know, as far as interoperability is concerned. Um, we don't certify or anything that's over in the FIDO land to certify whether you meet FIDO's goals or not, but we do the, the web API here, and hence the liaison that W3C now has with the FIDO organization. So that's, in a nutshell, that's what WebAuth then is about. So I'm open to, if you have time for any questions or, or anything, so let me know. That's fantastic, Tony. Thank you so much. Um, again, I'm going to start in the room. Is there anyone in the room with any questions for Tony? No. So, oh, is yeah. it available? Like, is yeah, it so, how, how far is it progressing? So, um, Simon here in the room is wondering how far it's gone in progressing, and is it now the standard? Yes, it's now a standard, and it's implemented. It's in all the platforms. So, Windows has it and it's built into Windows Hello. Um, Google has it, it's built into Android and it's, and it's built into Chrome and it's built into Edge on, um, on Windows platform and it's built into iOS and it's built into Safari. So it's on all the major platforms plus the mobile browsers have now picked it up and, and, have, and have started to implement it. You know, as I believe think mobile platforms like Samsung and 
and therefore have their own mobile browsers. And there's like the Brave browser and there's some other browsers that um, are, you know, not from the major vendors, but still well used out in the industry. And so they've also implemented um, the WebAuthn. So I would say this is one of the uh, very good success stories to try to get strong authentication out in the industry. All right, um, there's a question in the chat that says, how does WebAuth um, work in enterprise authentication like is our ID? And how do we link to auth um, authorization and request claims? Um, so that's part that we haven't done in WebAuthn because WebAuthn is strictly, um, a strictly authentication protocol uh, so far. And so as far as enterprise is concerned, there are things that we are working on for uh, what we would call enterprise attestation. Uh, and so these, these, in, an attestation is a, is, is a hardware, in, a, in this particular case is a hardware statement about the device, about the um, authenticator that you're using. And so we have, the notion here that enterprises could deliver you an attestation as part of rolling out your authenticator in the enterprise, uh, very much like they do MDM um, management of your devices in, in the enterprise, they can also manage your authenticator. And so then they would be able to control, you know, make sure that you're using an authenticate, you know, a WebAuthn based authenticator as you as you log on. So there are provisions for, we are making provisions for WebAuthn enterprise enhancements in level two. Um, as far as level one is concerned, uh, we didn't handle the enterprise situation fully. Uh, we needed to get something out the door and get all the vendors bought into it. And doing all that stuff in the first level is always the hardest part. So you know, we postponed that to level two to, and now we're making progress and people have all bought into the usage of WebAuthn and trying to make it better. Fantastic, any other questions? I think we're <laughs> letting Tony off easy here. All right then. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Really appreciate that. So, um, joining us next from New Zealand today is Kyle Zin Hotog, and Kyle contributes to design and development of standards in decentralized identity on behalf of Matter um, based in New Zealand. So, Kyle, the floor is yours when you're ready. Let's get my microphone on there, share the screen. There we go. And. Where's that old present button? Lander view. There you go. Oh. oh, there we are. Thank you. Alrighty, let me jump back one slide. Ah, I gotta love the internet. <laughs> there we go. Alrighty, uh, yeah, as Amanda mentioned, um, uh, this is an introduction to decentralized identifiers. And I'll briefly cover um, how it plays into decentralized identity, but um, not to a, to a large degree because much of that work is going on outside of W3C. Um, and so the, the focus here is gonna be on decentralized identifiers, um, which are a W3C uh, standard that is uh, currently in working group and, and working towards candidate recommendation at the point. So um, kind of to explain a little bit about this, um, First off, this, uh, this presentation um, I, I borrowed from uh, Marcus Sabadello and uh, Drummond Reed, who are W3C editors um, of the DidCore specification. Um, and so there is a longer presentation that exists here. Um, and so I wanna make sure I'm, I'm giving credit to, to the authors of this presentation. Uh, they graciously uh, made it um, Creative Commons licensed uh, so that I could reuse it. And you know, much of the, the space does these types of things. Um, so uh, to cover this a little bit, there's uh, kind of four levels that I'm going to talk about here. Um, I'm actually going to, or the original presentation talked about, and I'm actually going to, to drop one of these uh, in the interest of time 
Uh, the original presentation took about an hour and a half, um, and so I had to cut it a little bit short. Uh, similarly, so at the architectural level, I, I took a, um, some of the, the relative comparisons to things like self-certifying identifiers and um, traditional PKI structures that you'd use in uh, TLS systems, but uh, I try to, to focus on DIDs and, and the problem that they're attempting to solve. So the, the first level to, to focus on here is kind of the superficial level. Um, it's, you know, the, the very high level, how do I get, you know, kind of the mental model of what is a DID? Um, and the, the first part of it is uh, a DID is actually a URI. Uh, it's compliant with, uh, I believe it's RFC 3986. Um, and it's essentially a way to be able to identify um, a grouping of, of metadata and associated things uh, while also being able to identify a uh, what we refer to as a did subject uh, within the specification. Um, and so because of that, uh, it shares a lot of the same properties of URLs and URNs um, and is uh, actually compliant with both of the URL and URN uh, specifications. So um, uh, it's one of those things where um, you can use them as a did URL, as we refer to it, to be able to, re uh, to locate uh, essentially um, web resources or uh, the specific web resource that we refer to as a did document, um, but then also treat it as a URN, which is a persistent identifier um, to be able to uniquely identify the did subject. Uh, and again, uh, looking at this at, from the high level, uh, the four core properties of a did um, are a permanent um, persistent identifier, um, a resolvable identifier, uh, the cryptographic verifiability of the identifier and a decentralized identifier. So um, there's many other identifiers that exist out there on the web today, um, but the DID is unique in that it combines all four of these properties. So as a perfect example, a URL uh, is a permanent persistent, uh, it's not permanent, but it is a resolvable identifier um, and it is fairly permanent uh, in the existence, um, but uh, I can, can, um, uh, can change it and it rents it to you. Um, similarly, so you've got things like uh, Tor identifiers, which are cryptographic, um, uh, cryptographically verifiable identifiers. They're actually self-certifying. Um, and then they're also resolvable. Uh, they also carry the decentralized ident uh, identifier property. Um, but then again, uh, if the server goes down, then the identifier uh, also does not live on. So, uh, you know, these types of things come into play. And so that's kind of the, the focus of DID is to take these four core properties and combine them together uh, to create a, a stronger identifier. So next we'll talk about the, the functional level, uh, which is basically how do DIDs work? You know, how, how do they actually play into to software that we're writing today? Um, and so at the high level, uh, what I mentioned before is we've got DIDs, we've got DID documents and DID subjects. Um, these are kind of the, the three uh, core aspects that come into play. So uh, the first um, thing to, to take note of here is we've got a did itself uh, and it does carry a URI scheme. Um, and then we've got a, a method. Uh, so because it's resolvable, uh, there's gotta be a method to be able to algorithmically uh, make that work uh, so that your software can, can go and find uh, the associated information resource on the web. Uh, and then you've got what we refer to as the method specific identifier. Um, and the combination of these parts uh, make up the did under the did syntax. And that is a identifier that essentially identifies the did subject. Um, most commonly, we talk about this as if it's a non-information resource. So the best way to think about that is it's a person, a place, uh, or a thing, or an IoT um, device, or maybe an organization, essentially something that can't be uh, represented uh, specifically on the web because it's actually within meat space is probably the best way to do it. And um, similarly so, that identifier resolves to uh, the did document and that did document contains uh, metadata and is an information resource that is essentially describing the did subject or how to communicate with the did subject in an authenticated fashion. Um, so in this uh, white example here, we actually see that uh, there's an authentication block uh, within this uh, JSON object here, and that would contain something like a, a public key. Um, and I've gotten a, a more complete example in the next slides. Um, service endpoints are another way that you can use them to be able to communicate with it. 
So like I said, a typical DID document contains, you know, one or more public keys um, or other verification methods is the, the language we use. So um, while public keys are the most common, uh, there is other ways that you can verify people cryptographically. And that's kind of the idea behind this is that uh, I can use that um, cryptographic control to be able to control the identifier. And that's what those metadata uh, exist for. Uh, similarly, so you can have service uh, endpoints um, for the interaction with the did subject. Uh, so as a perfect example, um, uh, say I wanted to be able to interact with a, with a peer uh, directly through their device. I want a, a way to know how to communicate with that device that, that is communicating or that they um, use and, and live on. And so because of that, I want to be able to um, know how I can communicate with them. There's other pieces of additional metadata that exist as well, such as timestamps, uh, digital signatures, um, and cryptographic groups. We won't go into too much detail about them, but the idea is that much of this metadata exists to be able to prove cryptographic authority and to be able to build additional delegation and authorization and authentication mechanisms on it, on top of the, the DID. So at the at the low level, or the, the way to think about it, it is, it's essentially a slightly higher than a cryptographic key, but it still sits at a, a lower level of the stack in terms of uh, trying to move the plumbing and, and move the data around to, to get things uh, going. So like I said, this is an example of a, a DID document. You'll notice here that there's a, a public key and uh, we'll go into more detail about um, kind of how the this is valuable. Um, in terms of uh, public key and, and being able to uh, basically decouple the identifier uh, from the public key itself to be able to do things like key rotation and, and things of that nature. Similarly, so we've got uh, the service endpoint here. So uh, this example is, is presenting the idea of if I wanted to explain or exchange a verifiable credential, maybe I wanted to issue a verifiable credential to this dead subject, or I wanted to get proof uh, from them I could contact them using this HTTP URL. Um, and so uh, verifiable credentials are another specification that are commonly used uh, throughout the decentralized identity space. It is a uh, W3C um, recommendation at this point, and it, is, uh, in a, it, it has uh, also chartered a maintenance working group uh, for people who are uh, using that software or using that specification to build software, I should say. So like I mentioned, um, there is essentially did methods. Um, and so what this means is uh, it's easiest to think about it similar to DNS, um, but it's not DNS. And, and the reason for that is DNS is focused more on a protocol layer, whereas what um, the uh, did methods are focused on is kind of like an abstract functionality in order to uh, dereference or to resolve an identifier into that did document or a piece of information within that did document itself. Um, and so in some cases, such as this V1 method, uh, what you'll see is that you can actually just get that did document back directly. Uh, similarly, so if you're, if you're dealing with traditional web architecture, um, I can just go to a web server and, and get that did document and treat it just as a resource uh, that I'm used to dealing with in, in building other HTTP uh, based systems. Um, on the other hand, there's other uh, basically methods that combine many different transactions over a common lineage of time. Uh, and it takes all of those transactions and builds a did document in total. Um, and so because of this, we see that there's many different um, ways to be able to build these did documents. And this is where this idea of a method comes into play. Uh, there are basically different methods to be able to resolve or dereference a did into a did document. Um, and so, you know, like I mentioned, the, the idea of did resolution or uh, basically being able to resolve, that's where did resolution comes into play. Um, and so uh, one of the examples that, that comes up about with this is the idea that I may want to have an identifier, uh, such as an issuer for a verifiable credential, um, and I want to be able to resolve the public key that was actually used to, to sign this verifiable credential. Um, so because that identifier itself is not a public key, it doesn't fit very well into a actual um, verification API for something like a cryptographic um, 
uh, digital signature verification algorithm. Uh, and so this is where the identifier can help you to be able to uh, resolve that metadata so that you can actually uh, verify this object. Uh, again, talking about the, the house a little bit and covering kind of the, the key unique features. Um, so we've got um, DIDs themselves, which are the actual identifier. Um, and this identifier is basically the grouping of metadata associated with it that also identifies the, the DID subject. Um, but then when we're talking about the information resource, which is the DID document, I may want to refer to one specific aspect of, of that. So say, for example, I want to go and get just the public key. Uh, I actually have what's referred to as a DID URL, um, which is the combination of uh, the did plus this fragment identifier to be able to create the did URL and uniquely identify uh, that key so I can use it in certain scenarios. And so this is some, uh, some other examples of how you can use uh, did URLs um, that go along with this to be able to derive resources that are associated um, with the did subject and basically other metadata related to them. So the next level is the architectural level. Um, of why DIDs actually work. Um, so, you know, we've, we've basically seen um, many other PKI systems. Uh, we've seen other identifiers before. Um, so, you know, what is the actual kind of problem that they're gonna solve? Uh, so that's what I'm gonna cover first here in terms of the architectural uh, aspects of it. So the problem itself actually lies in the very nature of how public and private keys work. Um, and so the, uh, the nature of them is you kind of have a PKI trust triangle is, is how uh, Drummond Reed refers to this. Um, and so the, the idea behind this is that the controller um, has a private key um, that allows them to exert control over the public key or uh, essentially any other uh, data that can be verified by the public key. And then that public key get pub gets published. And in the nature of this, the private key needs to remain private. I mean, by the, by the name of it, that, that seems pretty clear. Um, and then the public key gets published. But that creates a problem. Um, and so because of that, the problem is essentially that um, how you strongly bind a public key to its controller so relying parties can know it's the, the right party. Um, put another way, uh, how do you know that that public key actually belongs to the person that you expect it belongs to? Uh, and that's where the, the identifier of the did comes into play. Uh, but the public key half of this is not actually the problem. Um, the public key is just a string of bits. You either have it or you don't. You know, it's a, the, the best way that I like to explain it, it's a number. It's a, a number that gets put into a mathematical function and outputs an expected answer or an unexpected answer, and that's what uh, determines if the digital signature is, is true or not. Actually, uh, the problem comes on the controller side of it, um, where you're starting to talk about essentially possession and, and knowing if it's the, the actual person that you're expecting. So essentially what that means is the controller exists in meat space and the private key and the public key exists in, in the digital space. Um, and what that creates is um, basically a problem where uh, the controllers need to be represented by some sort of uh, digital identifier. And that's where did step in. Um, so similarly, so talking about this, now that we've had an identifier in here, um, a good way to look at, uh, as Drummond calls it, the real PKI trust triangle, uh, is that you're actually trying to bind the private key, the identifier, and the public key. And we've seen systems um, that have done certain things like this uh, as well. So this is where self-certifying identifier systems have come into play uh, for PKI systems. And, and that's essentially what things like Tor have, have worked on. Um, but with that, we can actually see that this uh, creates two problems because now we've just taken uh, this line here and we've essentially created two lines. And so we have to figure out how we do the strong binding between both the controller to the identifier now, but also between the identifier and the uh, public key. And so with that, um, there comes an actual third problem um, that emerges from this. And so uh, this is kind of the, the target of, of DIDs as well, 
is the fact that how do you do key rotation and key recovery? Or put another way, um, what happens when you need to change your keys? Um, this is very common within cryptographic systems, either via compromisation or uh, because it's, it's just good practice and good hygiene that you should be changing your keys. Well, if your public key is your identifier itself, then how do you change that public key without, without also changing who you're talking about and being able to link those two together? So like I said, this is where the, the did steps in. So DIDs and DID documents can solve the controller identifier binding problem using what's called a self-certifying identifier. Um, I realize I actually just dropped the, the slide for this. Um, so I'm gonna jump back here to explain kind of what that is. Um, so the self-certifying identifier is essentially an identifier that uniquely um, binds this public key to the identifier by essentially deriving the identifier from the public key. And I'll, I'll step into it uh, in a second about how that actually helps um, uh, to, to solve the, the key rotation problem. But think of it essentially as the public key is the identifier for the first state. Um, but if the public key is the only thing that you have that exists, uh, that's still gonna create the problems. And this is where the using both the identifier and the did document to be able to uh, resolve these things allow you to handle the key rotation. So jumping forward to where we were. Um, secondly, it solves the problem of binding the identifier to the controller because only the controller can prove control of that identifier. Um, essentially, uh, you know, just as you would can prove control over a public key today, you'd use a digital signature with the private key to be able to, uh, to prove control over the identifier because the identifier is directly, uh, is strongly bound um, to, the, to that public key. And so to do that, uh, the DID controller uh, generates the original public and private key pair and the DID. Um, and they publish both that DID and the public key. And so this is where we're seeing that that um, public key is generated or that DID is generated from the public key. And then both of these are published together in essentially what is the, the DID document. And that's what we'll see next on the slide. So the DID document is essentially both the identifier and the public key itself that exists in that did uh, in that did document, and those are both published together. Now, when the did controller rotates the key, uh, it publishes a new did document and signs it with the original private key. So essentially, it's taken private uh, the the first private key, and it's decided it wants to add another private key. It's essentially just published that new public uh, public key, but it signed it with the previous uh, private key. And that's how you can essentially create a chain of trust very similar to what you've seen in um, certificate authority systems, but it allows you to track backwards to the original self-certifying identifier. Um, and so essentially each document essentially serves as a di digital certificate uh, for the new public key. Um, but you don't need any certificate authority or trusted third party uh, to be able to actually identify that um, identifier because the self-certifying identifier of the initial state of that um, did allows you to know that the did itself started as um, owned by the, by the um, controller. Similarly, so there's some additional benefits of the dids. Um, so one of the major benefits uh, is that a did document provides a simple and standard way to discover how to interact with the did subject. Um, and so this is where I was talking about the, the service endpoint. And this is where you kind of move into the, into the area of the decentralized identity aspect of it is because if I have a way to authenticate um, the did subject and I have a way to communicate with them, then this sets up basically a, uh, a nature to be able to run protocols over the top to have two did subjects communicate with each other with strong identification of it. Um, but again, like I said, we're not gonna really go into much detail of that. So um, with that, that's pretty much the, the presentation. Um, like I said, uh, you know, the original presentation and, and the um, better details and, and also I'll admit the, uh, the better presentation uh, pizzazz that comes with it um, can be found on ssimeetup.org. Um, that's most easily found uh, just by typing in SSI Meetup 46. That's uh, the 46 webinar for them. 
Um, and that was originally created by Drummond Reed and Marcus uh, Sabadell, who are the W3C DID Core specification editors, uh, as well as here's the link to the uh, DID Core specification. So with that, does anybody have any questions? Fabulous, Kyle. Is there anyone in the room with any questions for Kyle? No? Okay. Sorry? I know exactly where you're going with that. I do. All right, so we've got a question here. We're gonna type it in the room as well. Um, so the question for you, Kyle, is, are there any use case scenarios where um, for the documentation in the healthcare sector? Uh, so there is a use case document that uh, we're working on um, within the, within the um, space. And I know there are people who are directly working on healthcare. Um, uh, so I've I've actually seen some of the people um, uh, at Microsoft Health, I believe, have, who've been working on this. I've also seen pilot projects that have been uh, coming out of the UK in the NHS uh, to basically uh, uniquely identify doctors uh, using DIDs um, and verifiable credentials to be able to exchange those DIDs and the information. Uh, and so essentially what they're trying to do is they're trying to address the the scenario of how do I know uh, when a doctor shows up at a uh, hospital, how do I know that the doctor actually carries the credentials of being a doctor and how can we speed up the process of, of handling those um, interactions to be able to get the doctor working with patients faster rather than focusing on proving their credentials uh, using paper. Okay, all right, any more? Oh, anyone in the room? All right, so there's another question from the room that says, is the standard supported in the browsers and where in uh, are the did documents stored and published uh, did standard supported in the browsers um, that one is probably going to be a little bit harder to answer uh, I have not seen any browsers that are actually looking to adopt it at this point um, what it's been though is that it's a, actually a data model uh, that exists um, so as a perfect example uh, I've heard, um, and, and Tony may actually be able to, to provide a little bit of clarification on this, um, that people are interested in using DIDs with uh, WebAuthn um, in order to handle the key rotation um, aspect that comes into play with WebAuthn to be able to uniquely identify those things. Um, so in terms of like browser support, uh, that's where I could see that the DIDs would come into play. I've also seen that there's been some emerging standards called um, Credential Handler API which relies upon DIDs um, in order to do that. Um, but because of the way that the URIs are working, you're not gonna be able to just like type a DID into the URL bar and, and be able to resolve back the DID document or anything like that. Um, I see the, the second question that, that comes with this or where did documents stored and published? Um, so this one is actually a very interesting aspect. Um, the uh, DID documents can both be stored on most commonly uh, what we've seen is DID uh, on blockchains. Um, and so the reason for that is because of the immutable nature of the blockchain to be able to track the lineage of um, the keys and the key rotation over time. Um, but similarly, so we've seen uh, DIDs exist just on a web server uh, and that's using the DID web method. Um, uh, additionally, there's something called the DID peer method that exists in such a way where uh, the DID document is actually stored by the relying party um, and uh, each party stores the other person's parties, uh, the other party's uh, DID document. So another question here from Karen is, who is implementing DIDs today? Yeah, um, there are many people that are working on this. Probably the, the easiest way to figure this out is um, to take a look at the DID spec registries. Um, so we can see there's many different methods that are associated with this. Uh, there's been a lot of work that's gone on at the um, Decentralized Identity Foundation and Hyperledger um, in many different areas to be able to implement these um, DIDs. Uh, so let me jump in here real quick. And that might be in the way. So let me move that. So what we see in terms of implementation uh, for different DID methods, these are all people who have basically defined a DID method um, to be able to, to implement these types of things and who are using uh, DID methods. So uh, as a, 
you know, as an example, um, we've seen that um, Microsoft has been working on uh, building side tree support to be able to anchor uh, DIDs into um, uh, Bitcoin using a layer two support system. Uh, Matter uh, has existed um, to be able to leverage kind of the decentralized identity space. Um, there's a few people who are building things on top of Hyperledger Fabric. Um, we've seen that, you know, Workday has spent some time doing these types of things as well. Um, so we've gotten a lot of interest from um, kind of the blockchain space, but we've also seen interest from other uh, large technology organizations as well um, who, are, who are looking to implement these types of things. So um, there's a large list of people who are looking to implement them in many different ways. All right, uh, so we have another question. How can it be called a did URL when it does not conform to a URL, um, RFC 1738? Uh, so we've actually, we've had to debate this one a few times within the working group. Um, my understanding is that it's compliant with the, uh, um, what working group's definition of a URL, uh, rather than the RFC 1738 definition. Um, and probably the best way uh, to be able to understand that a little bit better is to look at the issue that we use to discuss that, um, to get kind of all the, the official details. So um, let me see if I can find it here. We've had uh, many different people kind of weigh in on this topic um, to, to be able to figure out the, uh, the justification. And, and as a working group, this was kind of the, the consensus that we, we came to um, in support with the, uh, with the W3C um, advisor, which is uh, Ivan Herman. Uh, that doesn't look like the right one. There was more discussion on this topic than that. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to, to find that, but uh, if you'd like, I can, I can directly um, link you to that um, in the chat as we get going. On to the next one. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Okay. Thanks, Kyle. So um, we're going to have a speaker right here in the room. How good is that, guys, for the people in the room? So like all of our speakers, um, David Cook has more achievements than I could possibly list in an intro. So I can tell you that he's a lecturer at ECU, who are a wonderful host today, um, and a researcher. David is particularly interested in the intersection between security and accessibility, and that's what he's going to be talking about this morning. So I'm going to change seats and bring up his PowerPoint, and we're going to share our screen now. Um, theoretically, we will, anyways. Oh, thanks, Kyle. Uh, okay, uh, thanks, Amanda, and um, uh, thank you for allowing ECU to host this event, because uh, we're, we're very, very pro-accessibility here. We're, we're not very um, fast to react to all of the different issues that keep popping up, but I can tell you we're absolutely in the game and we love embracing with the accessibility challenges. Um, and uh, so that's one of the reasons I'm really interested. Um, I I'm a bit of a fraud because I, I come from the cybersecurity side of the house and, and we're enemies of the accessibility side of the house. Okay, so I I'm <laughs> open disclaimer because it's really important that um, I think the conversation takes place, particularly this year with coronavirus. And I should also let you know, I've just recently um, won a coronavirus grant from the WA state government. So for those of you in WA, thank you for your taxpayers contribution. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, but one of the things I'm looking at, I specialize in the area of Garon technology. So older people and older people make up a very important part of the accessibility challenge because um, many of their uh, impediments and very many of their impairments are, are kind of partial impairments. You know, when we talk about someone with a vision impairment, we think of someone who has a profound vision impairment. But in actual fact, the very large number of people who are over the age of 65 um, have a vision impairment which is partial and which causes all sorts of issues in terms of security um, and accessibility. So I really want to touch on that in particular. Um, and part of my talk today will kind of just touch on some of the trends I've been researching. My particular coronavirus grant is looking at um, uh, older people in isolation and how they're dealing with technology access and accessibility. 
Where's my name? Oh, okay. Here we go. Okay. Um, so a couple of things I'm going to touch on today is that, you know, how do we have a discussion about security and accessibility at the same time? So I'm aware that I'm talking, to, preaching to the converted about accessibility challenges, but if we were in a room full of cybersecurity sub people, they would be downplaying the accessibility issues um, and upplaying the importance of security as if the two do not fall side by side. So when we're talking about this issue about there being a nexus between accessibility and security, perhaps really one of the things we should be talking about is that there's a great big no man's land where people who want to make things secure should never make them accessible. Um, and that's a really good way of making something secure. It's an excellent way of securing your money and your data is to make sure no one else can get to it. So um, right off the bat, that's the cybersecurity perspective and you may not want it or like it, I'm just telling you it's there. And, and uh, if, we're, uh, if we had armies lined up, there are more people involved in cybersecurity than there are in accessibility. Uh, that's just the unfortunate facts. You don't have to, don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> that's the fact that we're at. So I wanna to touch on some really interesting things about really simple stuff that I'm seeing in some of the trend data I'm capturing right now in Western Australia with older people in relation to passwords, capture, unintended consequences, the need for multi-factor authentication, um, issues, the wider issues about protecting critical infrastructure, and then just touching on some medical and financial data. Okay, so this diagram says it all. Um, we have this idea that as accessible accessibility challenges, we really want to make sure that um, anything that we uh, involve on the internet has some kind of instant access, some seamless access. But the reality is that um, all of the, the online chat, everything that the general public, the outward facing side of this um, um, problem sees is that there is, a, there is a security problem. And as Tony articulated so very well, there are so many different ways in which you can be fished, hacked, taken advantage of. In, and, and this challenge for us in one sense is obviously overcoming it through technology, but another sense is overcoming the conversation because the conversation is about the fact that we seem to be siding on the side of it's important to be more secure than accessible. Now, when I say we, that's not we in this room on this particular conversation, but it's the wider we. It's those people such as the millions of people who are older than, older than 65 years old in Australia, who when asked, who when asked to vote, will vote for things that sound secure as opposed to accessible. Now, they'll still want accessibility, but they'll put security first. And that relates to things like access to medical data. It relates to things like the uptake in the, the traceability apps that have been provided for coronavirus. All of these things have challenges that relate to both security and accessibility. And the security side of this particular diagram at the moment is winning. And you might be interested in trying to bring that back or at least perhaps trying to make both arrows point in kind of the same direction as opposed to what I'm showing you on this screen, which is in completely the opposite direction. So I specialize in the use of technology on older people because um, laggards, as I like to call my old, older friends, and I'm very close to becoming a laggard, <laughs> uh, if not already there, um, laggards are the fantastic, the best test group ever for anything you want to test. If you want to know where all the problems are, if you want to see where all the issues are, go and talk to older people because you just, they, they experience every single problem that we ever see and they'll experience five or 10 of them at one hit where we only get to see one or two. So one of the challenges is about understanding where older people put value things. Do they value things in terms of security? Do they value things in terms of accessibility? And which, which one wins when they're having a conversation? When they're having a conversation about putting their, their life savings at risk, which one wins? Is it security or is it access? Would they rather say, look, we'll eventually get to the bank and get some money in a week, or we need to have access to it right now? So that wider access question, and a lot of these things fine tunes down to the accessibility part of it, is really important. Um, the other thing is in terms of some understanding about accessibility that's workable and by workable, I mean seamlessly workable. I'm really excited about the work that Tony put up just now. I think it's fantastic. We need that right now. So, I mean, don't, don't sleep, Tony. Uh, uh, keep working because, 
because that sort of stuff, and it's great to hear it's very close to becoming part of the mainstream um, deployment. Um, it's not there for the average 65 or over year old person in downtown Western Australia. And then the other thing is about trying to understand these, this almost, there's almost a question about not celebrating. We need to celebrate these accessibility victories because there's no conversation that I hear regularly about celebrating accessibility. What I hear is a conversation where multiple companies uh, tend to sell um, their products, which are basically about security rather than accessibility, or it's security using accessibility to their third party access. And so it's accessibility for whom? Is it accessibility for the third party companies that are going to guarantee that your financial um, information or your data or your social media is safe? Or is it about real, real genuine personal accessibility, the stuff that, uh, you know, obviously with W3C people follow in a much more serious way? Uh, I want to give you a couple of examples and I, I'm going to talk about capture because I think captures it really helps us to understand the nature of the problem and and people like terms say oh, we're so past capture but the reality is that right now on any given day um, capture jumps up in many older people's screens and and causes problems and so here's a picture of a particularly old version of a capture you might say oh that's old why am we showing that because they're still around and that's a real problem um, now obviously for people who have partial vision impairments and I'm I'm partially visually impaired I have um, poor eyesight really bad about 30% in one eye I wear glasses and when I look at this particular capture I find it really difficult so the fact that it exists as a barrier to me accessing into any particular program um, is a problem for me um, so I'm resilient and I'm tough and I work as a lecturer so I'll overcome this and I'll keep going till I beat it but what does it look like when it's an older person? Now, older people don't have the same resilience. They look at these sorts of things, they go, I can't understand that. They give up very quickly um, or they move to something else. Now, you might say, that's fine. Why don't you go to the, uh, the audio version? Well, older people who have vision impairment also have hearing impairment. Um, they also have um, dexterity impairment. And so they might have arthritis or gnarly knuckles or in the case of me, just big fat fingers. And so all of these things combine to prevent access on a simple authentication or a simple Turing test such as capture. And that's a real problem. Not to mention all of the other stuff which bots are currently doing. So bots are really actively obviously churning out these things and, and as Tony's already articulated, they're very effective. And so these things are, are regular problems for us. Some of us are more familiar with the kind of recapture look of these particular coloured slides and there's multiple issues with these, but these are being becoming, since COVID-19, these are becoming kind of a go-to uh, method of some really quick, some down and dirty authentication, some down and dirty, are you really a human? Some down and dirty way of sort of saying, which is kind of a double check to just, you know, to make sure you're not a bot. And they're so terrible because they do two really bad things. Well, actually three things. The first thing is there's some confusion. I've got, got the classic one up here, which is about select all the images with an orange. The problem is that some people will interpret that who are looking for images as things that have the color orange, as opposed to an orange that you might eat. Um, and so that's a real problem. But more importantly, is the fact that for many, many uh, companies who choose to use recapture or this kind of, of capture device, um, and that's, we're talking millions of users of this sort of thing millions of businesses are using this, is that you can select your own level of, of, um, uh, of guessability. So for example, this is a nine square capture, recapture. Uh, you don't have to get all of the squares right. So the, in here, there's a picture of an orange in the top left-hand corner and a picture in the, top, in the bottom right-hand corner. But on various companies, and I can, I've just been doing some work on a particular company who's a, a well-known chain of cinemas here in Western Australia, um, they will allow you to join up, to sign up to their particular cinema club. Um, and when they ask you to proof that to uh, go through a recapture, they'll allow you to get 50% of your answers wrong three times in a row. Because recaptures are just simply about saying, are you partially human? Do you sometimes get things wrong? Right? Because that's a human quality, right? Um, and so what we, <laughs> what we see is it's an attempt by companies who think that um, this kind of authentication or Turing tests are effectively too hard to make it so easy that it can be easy and you can get things wrong and still get through. So that's a problem because it's presenting the idea to people that security is, oh, I can do this. I should follow this because it's easy. 
right? It doesn't actually make you any more secure. In fact, what it means is that you've joined on a, you've uh, um, passed through a recapture, but so have thousands of bots because a botnet can make just as many informed guesses. If it knows to, to look for these kinds of things where um, access is granted um, to uh, an information database based on you simply proving that you get things 50% of the time right, well, that's one, that's a bot that's going to be flooding your system. And that's exactly what's happened with this particular cinema company in Western Australia, that they've been inundated with effectively, that they've just been completely monged by a set of botnets. And that's a problem. So this issue of older people is really important. And I, I would, in terms of trying to turn this around, if there's a victory in sight for the W3C community in a broader, wider sense, and I'm in a victory about how do you take the challenge of the security versus the accessibility, then it should be celebrated in the older space. It's about the sort of stuff that Tony was talking about earlier about um, access, and it's about making that access seamless so that uh, it's not about having to put in, um, I mean, one of the things that's happened since coronavirus co has come along is more than ever, we are reliant on our mobile phones to have on any given day, dozens of times where we get a text message or some kind of authentication that asks us to valid, revalidate that we are who we are. And the mobile phone has become our central point of proof, if you like, that we are who we are. But at what cost? Well, the cost to older people is simply disengaging from the online community. The cost for older people, and, and I've only just been starting to do the coronavirus uh, um, um, uh, studies, but so far with 12,000 older people, overwhelmingly around about 85% simply disconnect when they get asked to have to re, re uh, acknowledge something through a text message or through something like that. Now that's a large number of people who are isolated, who are living in country areas or are living remotely. And remember remote in 2020 is I'm living at home. So that's remote as well. Uh, and so these are a large number of people who are making huge disengagements. That's a real problem. So, so rock on to something that's a little bit easier than that, because that's not the way we want to go. The other stuff which I, I really want to talk about is this notion that, that um, because of this poor accessibility, we've got older people who are making some really, really poor choices in regards to financial services, online banking and those sorts of things. Um, financial elder abuse has never been higher in the last 30 years. We have never seen so much financial elder abuse. And I'm talking about wider Australia, but certainly on the trends on this coronavirus study that I've been doing. We're seeing large numbers of people who are simply disengaging from using online banking and online services and instead turning to using other people to help them. So, and that means sometimes it's their next door neighbour or sometimes it's the, the gardener or the cleaner or sometimes it's their son or their son-in-law or their really greedy grandson who thinks, look, you know, granny's getting old. She doesn't, she won't mind if I steal this $2,000 out of her account whilst helping her to get $100 to pay her bills. And that's the sort of stuff we're seeing, large numbers of financial elder abuse. And there's some reports in the offing that are going to come up that are going to, you know, really make us sit up and have a look at that idea. So the general problem that we've got is that security is winning the war in terms of either turning people off using technology in the case of older people, or it's making things harder to, you have to try harder to prove yourself to gain access in the first place. And so that's an accessibility issue in a wider sense. So if we have a look at the sort of stuff which is happening with coronavirus, and these are WA trends, I, I, I stress I have not finished this study, but I can give you some indication of the trends. Um, there's, um, an increased reliance on online systems that the user is uncomfortable with. And that can be medical health data updates. We've seen that, um, I'm gathering some of the data on, on older people who have been, who've gone for a coronavirus or COVID test to find out that they're very uncomfortable about the online processes that have led them to get there in the first place. Simply people wanting to have a, um, a visit with their local GP and having to do an online access to gain access to get an appointment in the first place that are causing people so well I just I want to go to the doctor this is another reason to stay home um, if you were to talk to my wife she would say that uh, you know I don't need any reason to convince myself never to go to a doctor because I'm bad like that so some people are at a disadvantage in the first place but for other people who are, to, who are seriously ill uh, the confrontational aspect of trying to make a doctor's appointment and the online versions of what we've rolled out in 2020 
are simply really problematic in regards to making sure that we have quality healthcare. So that's a problem. Um, forced into attempting transactions that people are not sure uh, that are not sure about, and that's a huge problem. So, for those people who found themselves in lockdown, who found themselves isolated, who found themselves um, a distance from relatives because of, of state borders or, or other issues, uh, for those of people who've had financial, you know, they've lost their jobs or that they can't afford various other forms of, you know, the number of people who've dropped off, you know, have a look at the stats on people who are dropping off the internet. Those of us who can afford it have never used the internet more, and those of us who've lost their jobs are struggling to find ways to pay for the internet. So we've got issues about online services during COVID-19 lockdowns, rapid rise in online scams, um, and the sorts of ones that I'm hearing on older people, the ones that really seem to resonate um, are about fake coronavirus tracing trackability apps. So there's a, a, an enormous number of of people who've given up. So the real tra trace apps are not getting a fair play because older people simply think that it's a scam. Uh, we've got Uber Eats scams, um, and that's that's uh, probably the, the highest peak of all of them. Home shopping scams, where people are trying to work out ways in which they can order deliveries and have them, uh, groceries and have them delivered home, but, but finding that they can't go through just even the authenticity, the accessibility, uh, and the multi-factor authentication devices to actually be able to order you know, $30 worth of groceries. So these are real issues and they're part of this ongoing battle between security and accessibility. And I say it's a battle, although many of the people I'm sure online are saying it shouldn't be a battle. It should, we should be working together on this. I completely agree. I'm just telling you the trends that we're seeing. So having a look at some of the things, these are some of the oldies but the goodies that are coming back. We need to reduce the complexity of interfaces. It's as simple as that. We just need to make them less complex for older people. We need to remove layered windows that challenge a lot of these you know, motor functions, even you know, simple things like drag and drop features. Um, we need to format consistently through web design, um, and we're not doing that. So there's in massive inconsistencies on, on uh, web developers, some of whom are on the W3C bandwagon, but most of whom, unfortunately, are not yet there. Um, and so partly what we need to do, I suppose, is we need to celebrate those people who are, and we should put them on pedestals and you know, shine torches at them so we can see them. But, uh, and I guess the other part is I'm, I'm never a big fan of the, the, the stick version of the carrot and the stick, but perhaps we do need to out a few more of these major developers who are refusing to understand accessibility issues in the mainstream needs for older people. So obviously, as I just mentioned, keyboard functionality, drag and drop features, these are really hard things for people who've got arthritis, really hard things for people who've got gnarly fingers. And if you're talking about working on a tablet, then just people who've got fat fingers. They're just fundamental problems that, that we, you and I don't think about enough that are facing older people in isolation who are at home. And because granny's now got an iPad, we're thinking everything's okay, but it's not okay. And massive accessibility issues um, are in abundance. So the other part of this, I suppose, is you know, we, could, we can go down the path of saying we need to provide training. Um, we need to do that training with things. I'm a big fan of YouTube clips. I think YouTube clips that explain to older people how to do things is great, um, uh, as long as they're authentic. And as long as they don't, they're not, come, they're not kind of couched with some kind of third party advert that drags us away to someone's particular product or service that helps, you know, purports to help people, but helps themselves at the same time. So I'm not sure that providing training is the answer. What I know is that it's certainly in the mix. What we need to do is to draw attention to the fact to those people who are in the business of, of authenticating, um, who are providing services that prevent access to older people to sit up and take note of the problem that we have. The other thing that we're seeing in my study, so far only 12,000 people in terms of security of passwords has seen a massive rise, a massive rise in what we call derivative password usage. That is people who use the same password with kind of a few extra add-ons. So um, of course there are always gonna be some people who have silly passwords, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. I'm not really worried about them because there'll always be silly people who do anything. Um, and uh, that's, that's not gonna change. But what has changed in coronavirus is the number of people who have been confused because they've got much greater online usage and they've had to rely on various different passwords and they've found themselves fighting between whether they're on one particular browser or another particular browser and they've been confused about their various different accounts. So 
when we see a person that takes, you know, their favorite pet, Fluffy, and then they have to create new passwords for whatever reason, mostly because of some ridiculous concept of having to put in a new password, maybe the old password's three months old, so let's put a new one in. They change from Fluffy to Fluffy One, and then they change from Fluffy One to Fluffy 27, because they're born on the 27th of May, right? Um, or Fluffy 1952, because that's the year they were born, or Fluffy 1981, because that's when they were married. Or Fluffy spelled backwards because maybe that helps too, right? These are all really, I mean, they're, they're funny, but what they're, but what they're actually doing, and yeah, I can see people in the room here, they're going, yeah, no, that's me, that, that's mine, the third one out. But even I did a quick study just recently on um, football people. And so um, as a Eagles football tragic for the West Coast Eagles, um, um, it's we interesting. It it's interesting the number of people who have um, Eagles as their password, but of course they use derivative version. So there's Eagles 2018 because that was the year they won a premiership. And then there's Eagles 2019, and then they're forced into changing that to Eagles 2020. It's the same password, and so they're no more secure. And in fact, when we're talking about the stuff that Tony touched on in terms of um, being able to find these, you know, um, latent passwords, things that are left behind, be able to hash them, and the use of botnets, they're in a world of insecurity which means that gives, I guess, a bravado to the cybersecurity community to be even more uh, likely to say, look, it's not about accessibility. This is important. We have to secure old people. If in fact, that means that they no longer use their accounts or rely on their neighbor to somehow, um, somehow get their money from them or their, you know, the guy down the street to, that you trust, right? Because he goes down to the ATM and only pulls out the $50 but you'll never know because he screwed up the other receipt and you can't see it online because you don't know how to access your own online banking. Okay, so obviously this has wider implications for everyone else. It's not just older people. I just like to use older people because laggards absolutely reveal the black and white, the grim reality of the difference between security and accessibility. And whilst I'm, a comp I'm an advocate for trying to make security and uh, for secure accessibility and accessible security, we are not, trends are saying opposite. Of all the different things you could talk about with the accessibility community, the accessibility community is slowly inching, inch by inch towards winning the war with one exception, security. That's the one area that W3C is not winning the war in. They've got great ideas, things are happening, but for every person, for every Tony in the world who's doing great work on work on Authen, there's a hundred other security people who are unraveling it and finding some other kind of authentication dilemma. And that is our challenge. That is our problem. Um, the other thing that all of this is built on is not so much accessibility and security, but it's just simply built on trust. And people are making very human decisions, particularly with coronavirus, about the fact that if they don't trust a system, if they, didn't, if they had a bad experience once, or maybe they talked to a friend who had a bad experience, then they're not gonna trust it as well. And so at the, at the heart and soul of the solution for this security and accessibility nexus is the notion of things that we can always trust, not sometimes trust or it once worked or whatever, but a situation where trust never leaves the page and that is the real challenge for the W3C community, in my opinion. So obviously we can go human on this. We can get people to do things like using, you know, their, their brain is the best possible place to store things. I'm not a big advocate of trying to get people to store their information on other people's computers, because when we're talking about older people, that has problems with trust. And unfortunately, we're still, we're still trying to come to grips with, you know, cloud storage on a lot of free things which is really, you know, when we're talking about that, we've got to face up to the grim realities that cloud sometimes is sophisticated, but for many of the people, things that older people deal with, cloud is just a dingy shed somewhere in a third world country. And so cloud is not great. And you might say, well, how about you use your brain to remember your password rather than putting it into an app, right? Um, recent stuff with, you know, with obviously with different, um, um, apps that allow you to collate all of your passwords and so like that have been highlighted by a recent purchase of a very big um, pass, uh, pass keep uh, device where the Hells Angels bikey gang bought it out. Why would a bikey gang buy an app that stores passwords? You have to ask yourself that question. And do you now trust any of the apps that you have? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I know that, it, so to some extent, is it security and trust about the system? Is it security about the people, the ownership, the intention? Is it security about the fact that it's your information on someone else's machine or someone else's cloud 
or both. So how do we convince people? I mean, I've got some pretty fluffy stuff here, so I'll just quickly go through this. But the first is that you can't afford to ignore people with accessibility needs. And I'm preaching the converted, except to say that the current security trends is ignoring people with accessibility needs. Overarchingly, it's, it's overwhelmingly, it's doing that. The second is that accessibility is not an add-on. You can't just throw it in on the end of a website. You can't just say, oh, let's put some accessibility stuff in here and just make it happen. That the, that, that the, the, the development world needs to understand that accessibility is the first thing on the list, not the last thing. It's the first thing, the second thing, the third thing, and it's at every stage of development because we're not doing that. Um, and the third thing is this understanding of trust, right? So I'm really sick and tired of different banks, particularly some of our international banks, that have mandatory systems of authentication, which simply force people to not use their banking, but to rely on someone else to try and figure it out, because that's the breakdown in the accessibility issue between accessibility and with security. So pretty much, I mean, I'm, I'm saying like this is an advert for W3C, but the, the problem I'm trying to put forward today is that whilst the people who are online now are already on side, we are not doing enough in terms of celebrating our victories and in calling out those people who are not part of the part of the um, uh, part of the solution, but are actually part of the problem. And that's the cyber security community of which I put my hand up and say I'm one of them. And I'll end there with just the notion that you know it's uh, having started a particular uh, trend trial looking at older people in Western Australia. I thought I would find a few problems, but I'm completely flabbergasted at the sheer volume of older people who have disengaged from online usage. And their issues are in relation to complete distrust of an online health data system, their complete distrust of online banking and their complete distrust of social media. And in these parts, the security um, part of that very, that diagram I showed you is winning the war. And they're not just winning it by, you know, by one or 2%. They're, they're so far ahead, um, it's, uh, it's shocking and shamelessly um, awkward to even make the words come out of my mouth. And I'll finish there. Thanks. Thank you, David. I think there was a question that popped up, so we'll just stop sharing screen. And we'll... All right, so there's a question there from David for you. Can you read that? So, uh, was it? As part of the study, have you factored in the yeah, age of technology yeah. being used by older people? Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so, so, as, yeah, have we factored in the age of technology? So, the study we're looking at um, looks at all people's technology. So, it does. So we record particularly, particularly mobile devices, any technology that's used in, um, uh, any technology that's used in isolation. A great majority of that technology is in the case of, of uh, in the case of tablets and mobile phones. It's not, it's not an iPhone 11. It's not a, you know, it's not a 2020 version of an Android phone. It's usually something much older. So that is an issue. Um, and, but, but I, I think we should accept that that's going to be the case. Older people are not made of money and they're certainly not in a position to spend large amounts of money this year on technology. So yes, that's absolutely a problem. Compatibility is an issue in terms of online usage. Um, I'm, what I'm seeing in the study so far is loads of pe older people who are simply who've been set up with a desktop computer, but maybe maybe their sons or daughters or their family are not around to visit so much because of coronavirus, and so they're just simply not, not using the um, use of uh, the on-home computer or laptop computers has dropped right off. A lot of it is coming back to mobile phones, and mobile phone usage is really being quite, is being sort of shrunk down to just I'll just have phone calls with my family because I don't trust all the online apps. Sorry to say. Right, so I would like to have, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, it sounds like Tony would like to have you come and have a chat to uh, the WebAuth working group. So um, we'll put you in touch, Tony, for sure. Um, have you found that older people understand the implication of weak passwords? So that's a really good question about whether older people understand um, weak passwords. I think they understand that it's important to have a, a strong password, but they don't understand what a strong password is. I had a, you know, I had an older person who came up and said, I've got this fantastic password, you'll never guess it. I've been using it for seven years. So 
there's the problem. He's been using it for seven years. And of course, the sorts of stuff he's been using it for is to support his photos in the cloud or his, his Google or whatever it is, all these different stored things. And, uh, you know, the, the, the best, the most vulnerable part about a password is having one that's seven years old. Um, and he couldn't understand because he, he came to see me about a particular um, problem that he'd had. And uh, he actually lost a bit of money in his superannuation account. It was a couple of hundred thousand dollars and he had to sell his house and stuff went south for him. And it all really came back to the fact that he had a seven year old password. So, so your question about do people understand the implication of weak passwords? Yes, they do. But their perception of what a weak password is is that it's like it's um, one, two, three, four, five, six, not, not some incredibly complex thing that he had that he never changed for seven years because it was so awesome he couldn't possibly want to change it. That's the problem. And, and, and again, with all of the various different, different ways in which botnets can grab information, remnant data left on systems, remnant data left in clouds, um, all the different password authentication systems, botnets, and everything else you need to have you need to change your path. If you're using passwords, um, and obviously we'd love to move away from that, but if you are using passwords, you do need to change passwords regularly and not to something that's just, you know, fluffy cat one, fluffy cat 11 or whatever. So, yeah. I've um, got another question. So a little more on that. What would be the most effective way to secure passwords for older people? So, um, again, we go back to human qualities because, uh, and with the exception, exception of uh, dementia and Alzheimer's patients, and I have a special category for them because one of my areas of gerontology is in um, security and online security for dementia patients. So we'll put that aside for the moment. But for the great majority of older people, simply the best way that they can stay secure is by using a passphrase rather than a password. So a passphrase is something which is a human quality and people can remember that much, much easier. So um, they can carve it up. Um, and and they can, they can take phrases which are meaningful to them. I, I mean, I have one that I use, a particular one, which is um, bye bye Rosie, off you go, Birmingham by Great Western. Now, most of you wouldn't know what that means. It's a, if for those of you who are from the UK, it, that sounds like a train route, but it's not, uh, this, that doesn't make any sense. Simply it's the um, first letter of each word of the resistor color code. So if I look at the risk, so for those of you who are, you know, the, the resistor color code is black, brown, red, orange, yellow, green, um, uh, something, violet, gray, white. And so, and so I remember it as bye, bye, rosy, black, brown, red, off you go, orange, yellow, green, Birmingham, bye, great western, blue, violet, gray, white. Um, so there's my, there's my incredibly complex, and yet to me, that phrase, bye, bye, rosy, off you go, Birmingham, bye, great western, I've had for 30 years. So if you're an older person, pick a, don't pick that one. I've just told you, I'll, I'll go and change my passwords since I finished this. But um, <laughs> pick a passphrase that makes something sense to you. And if you're religious, jump into the Bible and find a phrase and carve it up into six passwords. And that way you can just remember the one phrase for a couple of years. And you know, when you've done one for three months, jump into another one and another one. I make a point of it. And I tell to older people is every three months, just change all your passwords, change them all to the same thing, but just have it for three months and then get rid of it. Much better that you regularly change your passwords than that you simply are left with 20 different passwords or 10 different passwords that you can't remember. Because that behavior is what absolutely leads people to starting to think about um, uh, derivative passwords. So I can remember Eagles, so I'll go Eagles one, Eagles two and whatever. And so it, it, it goes there. My personal one, you know, Carlton 16 flags. Um. <laughs> see, and, and this is the problem, okay? I'm everyone's got, but everyone's got a particular password, that, a word that sticks in their head. And even though we don't want to, remit, to admit it um, online or anything, we actually, all of, us, all of us have a go-to password that when we have to log into some silly app or something that requires some kind of password authentication, we have a go-to word or phrase, which is our throwaway password. And they are actually really dangerous because if you're a botnet and you start to work, oh, that's, you know, what was that one? Carlton 16. <laughs> Carlton flag. 16 flag. Okay, so if that's I'd like to say one, that louder for the Eagle supporters. Yeah, um, <laughs> then Carlton 16, I can't even remember 2016, it's a blur to me, but okay. But if that happened, then, um, so one of the problems is if we have a particular phrase like that and we use it for all of our throwaway things on the competitions we enter, or all the things that human people are doing just as part of normal life, the stuff we do, then that particular password becomes a real, uh, uh, um, a meta tag honey net, if you like, 
for a bot next to go, ah, ah, she's, she's looking at something and we can try and create the information about the kind of things and the kind of sites you go to, the sort of weird stuff that you and I look at, but we don't want to tell everyone else about what we do. All right. So um, often when we're setting a password, you'll see weak or strong. How valid are these? Well, that's a really, another really good question. They're valid in the context of the company that is putting them up in the first place. So uh, companies can get to choose a range, if you like, of, of uh, a range of strength between these things. So for example, uh, someone can make a set of passwords and their version of weak can be super, super, super weak. Or in the case of this university, uh, we could, at ECU, we could have set that starts at the mid range and says, we're going to assume most people are coming with some you know, quite clear understandings about things and they can be uh, start quite hard up to really, really, really hard. Uh, and, and so it's a range of that. So there's no telling when you look at things, but I can assure you when you can type in, you know, um, duck one, um, that that sounds pretty weak, right? Um, but if you have to go to a, a number of additional characters, if you have to use these different kind of um, capital and so on, I guess it forces you into thinking things. Having said that, there's a lot of studies that suggest that putting in, you know, an exclamation mark and a capitalization and, and a number are uh, actually no longer really defeating any of the, the, the decryption devices that are able to tear apart passwords. So they may not be your best bet, although really you're just completely acceding to whatever the rule that the company set up. If the company says that for this thing, you have to do up to eight characters and you have to have a number and you have to be alphanumeric and you have to have a, you know, exclamation mark or something, then, then you're just following the rule that doesn't actually make you any safer. So it's a good question. I think a lot of people are fooled into thinking that their, their password is strong because it's complied with whatever the rule that the company has put up for that particular password entry. I've got a question actually. Is it, is it the case that, um, this is something that I heard years ago, I don't even know where it came from, but that talking about the rules that are put on, like if they say it has to be eight, it has to have a capital letter, it has to have this and that. Does that, if you're like, you know, a computer like ratcheting through trying to crack things, does it mean that if you have to follow those certain rules, there's actually less potential passwords, so that make, then makes it easier, is that? It just definitely narrows it down. And, and also, there's a number of parts of those, one of the reasons some of those rules are really silly is that when we're talking about capitalization, almost everyone's gonna make the first letter of the capital. Right? So something like 95% of all people when they're asked to make a capitalization somewhere, don't make it the, the third letter in because it's easier for them to remember. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, the overwhelmingly, the, the most important number to remember on a password is the number one because it's the one that 80% of people use. Right? So if my password's David, it's David one. Okay, and then if I have to change it, it might be David zero or David two or J David one one or or it's going to be my birthday. So it's going to be da you know David twenty seven or David you know, nineteen fifty two or there's going to be some number of significance. You know, I can remember doing one of these um, uh, guess your password competitions with people. We, we were just doing some brute force guessing, and uh, it happened to have a at the time the police commissioner, and he was so crazy you'll never guess my password. It was just his police number, right? It was on his epaulet. Um, so, <laughs> and I got into trouble for that because he said, oh, you, you, you shouldn't have said that to the whole audience. I said, well, you shouldn't have used it. <laughs> so I think, I think that's the problem yeah. is we do, we can lull ourselves into a false sense of security about that. So is it then the case that, uh, so if, if human predictability comes into play, are we better off using something that randomly generates? Absolutely. Look, the one-time passwords are going to be way safer than anything we can do in terms of these regular things. The problem is, if I look at this older community, the older community has no, no sense of user acceptance of a one-time password yet. We are not at that place. Yeah. There's a, such a complete lack of trust. And part of that lack of trust with a typical you know, OTP is that if it relies on having some confirmation come back by SMS or some confirmation by some other third party mechanism, which is technologically, technologically easy to use, then it's the sort of thing that's going to put off a huge portion of those older people. They're not going to trust it because they go, oh, what's this? I might add just, we, we've seen a, an enormous spike in SMS messages that have scams built into the pop-up component of an SMS. That is a 2020 trend, which we didn't have last year. And so there's people coming up with, you know, um, uh, click here to uh, ensure your the, your um, COVID traceability app is working or click here to check your medical records are safe. 
Now, we've had that in the form of phishing and in, in emails and things, but to actually see them in pop-up things where it actually starts on the text, the SMS message, where it says a header that says Australian government to make you think it's from the Australian government, that's a whole different level of asking people to accept trust because they look at the SMS and say, well, that, you know, that's not an email. This must be real because it's in my SMS, where it could be just as easily fake. Like the SMS, that's just in Australia, very, very, absolutely. Very easy for me to send you a message and make you think that I'm your mother-in-law ringing you uh, or the tax department or the local, as was uh, in fact a case reported on the 6PR radio last week, the, the local cleaner from 6PR was, was rung by a number from the Subiaco police station, that which, which the guys verified was from the police station, but of course the caller had been able to spoof the number and create the impression of trust. Well, I, had a, I actually had a text message from the ATO, the Australian tax office, um, and I called the ATO and they said we have no record of contacting you. Um, which so really interesting, um, and it would be interesting, Simon, from a, a state government. We have someone from state government here, and from a state government view, we now have things like you know at, at a federal level, my gov uh, services, which are all relying when you sign in on that second authentication using your mobile phone, have the older generation. Given we manage all of our government services now almost entirely online through my gov services, how they find that balance because that would be really I find it frustrating mm. <laughs> I can only imagine being 30 years older than I am now trying to organize that yeah and I and unfortunately from a digital perspective we, we need to build into our operating models the notion that there will always be the need to face to face but you can't solve every problem by going digital and that's at the federal level that's at the state level there's no way we need to cater for that because the solution is, hasn't been, you know, it's, it's highlighted us to, to all the issues and all the gaps in, in those that operating model, and um, it hasn't been solved. Um, I mean, I mean, as an example, run, running WA Gov, we collected feedback uh, on the website, and we deliberately chose for accessibility to not to use recaptures. Man, I just we need to repeat that because sorry, maybe come over to the mic Simon, and repeat happy that. To come over to the get mic. Get Simon to come close to the mic. So, quite rightly saying, can you repeat the live question? So, jump in and um, yeah. So, just just coming back to deliberate um, choices that we made at the state government level um, with operating WA Gov. Um, so, with the feedback mechanism that we run on the website, we for accessibility choices deliberately did not um, use recapture. Now, from a bot perspective, uh, we were getting 90% of the feedback received on the site was spam. And so that meant internally, we actually had to trawl through all of this rubbish to, to actually um, to find genuine feedback that we were receiving from the public. Now, internally, we're not resourced to, to do that. So, you know, we would look at time and again, so what, what is the solution? How do we know that someone, I, on the internet is a real person and it's not a bot. And, and David, come back to your, the presentation, that balance between accessibility and security, it, it hasn't been solved. So we, we chose accessibility. Uh, in I that, have a potential in, solution for you. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in the end, I mean, the next iteration, we've chosen to outsource the whole lot and we've gone with a third party tool that, that we've let them solve it. But um, anyway, I'll leave that there. Yeah, so no, I'm just going to end with one little thing. There's a question here that says, uh, can you trust one password, last pass, and secrets, et cetera? And my, my answer is a blunt. Um, better off um, your information in your head than your information on someone else's machine or even on your machine but with someone else's access to it. Always better you trust your own brain. All right. Um, I'm going to cut it off there. Really good conversation, though. Um, and fabulously entertaining. I, I, I'm, I'm so fat. I've actually, I heard a version of this talk last year and um, obviously before coronavirus and it's equally fascinating the second time around. So um, thank you, David. And, um, you know, if you want to get in touch with any of our speakers, please let me know and I will, um, I will share details so you can get in touch with them and ask some more questions about the work they're doing. So last but not least, um, is Vivian Conway. So Vivian is the director of WebQIT, a former W3C evangelist, and of course, 
the best boss in the world. Am I laying it on too thick? <laughs> yeah, Mark. <I'm laughs> you know, gotta keep trying. Um, so, without further ado, uh, Vivian's going to speak to us about ethics and professionalism in the IT industry, which, towards the end of um, David's presentation, he actually also touched on. So, off you go, Vivian. It's all yours. Thank, thank you very much. Can you see my screen? I'm just hoping that this yep. is working. Um, working perfect. Yeah, I'm just not getting my presenter view here. One second here. So it's just being weird. Give me half a second. My mouse is going AWOL. Okay, for some stupid reason. <laughs> well, Naturally. Yeah. Okay. I, okay. Got it. Okay. So today I want to talk very briefly about the role of ethics and professionalism, our individual role and responsibility in our organizations, and whether ethics really matter and how it affects the users. So the picture in this slide is of a statue at a boy's home in the U.S. And it's the inspiration for the song by the Hollies, He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother. And the reason I like this concept is that if we help to bear each other's burdens, they don't seem as heavy. We walk together and we share the load together. Ethics is defined as a moral philosophy or code of morals practiced by a person or a group of people. An example of ethics is the con code of conduct set by a business. So hopefully you'll agree with me that the aspect of caring for our fellow human beings is a key component of ethics. Consider the concept of it's everybody's responsibility. Everyone has the right to access information, but it's up to us to ensure that they can. After all, everybody matters. This usually leads to the reality that nobody takes ownership. Consider the words in the poem pictured here, Mr. Nobody. Does it sound at all familiar? Do you remember those OH&S signs on the restroom mirrors which appeared quite regularly for a while? Safety is everyone's business. Or in the staff room, clean up your own mess, your mother doesn't live here. I've often said that people don't have disabilities. We all have a unique set of abilities or capabilities that we are either born with or develop over time. We disable others by putting stumbling blocks in their paths, such as poor design. Have you ever seen someone get out of a car, parked in an acrod spot, and wondered if they really have a disability? Remember that you can't see them all. It's pretty easy to sit back and judge others based on appearance or perception alone. You might say that this is all very interesting, but does any of this concern an organization? Isn't it just a personal decision? Have you ever worked for an orga organization where you could not support their ethics or integrity or lack thereof? How frustrating was it? Most people don't want to stay working for that type of organization. We all want to work for an organization that reflects our personal ethics, how we view others, our responsibility for the welfare of others. Remember our theme here, helping others and ethics. How we treat others reflects our integrity and our ethics. So where does that leave us in the IT industry? Most organizations have a mission statement, perhaps even statements about core values. And maybe they have a statement about accessibility in their documents or on their website. Not-for-profit organizations and government agencies in Australia must have a Disability Access and Inclusion Plan, a DAPE. This is generally where it all tends to come to a screeching halt. We make statements, but often do little about putting those lofty, idealistic statements into something practical, something that reflects business as usual in our organization. If I'm not even trying to make my, market my services to people who have disabilities, do I need to be concerned if they can't use my information source? Does an organization have an obligation to ensure that everybody can use their products or services? Can we ignore people with disabilities? After all, they're in a minority. When electronic gaming started, no one considered a blind or a one-handed gamer would even be interested. Now they're an important segment of the industry. 
What if my products aren't even meant for senior citizens? I might be offering a bungee jumping experience that I don't mean to sell to people with disabilities or senior citizens. So why should I be concerned? Can't we choose who we want to serve our products and services to? The answer is not in who you think might want to buy your services, but in the fact that you're placing public information in an advertisement format, such as a website, and you don't have the right to exclude people with disabilities. Perhaps my 94 year old mother wants to buy that bungee jumping experience for her grandson or even herself. She has the right to purchase this and has the right to have the material presented in such a way that she can use it. And there's actually a couple of legal precedents here that come to mind. The University of Miami were sued because they accepted a blind student into veterinary school and then didn't pro provide learning materials in Braille. She was unable to be, complete the course and as a result was denied her future, desired future occupation. It's not the university's right to decide whether a blind person would make a great veterinarian. Perhaps the student wanted to offer health information on guide dogs to fellow blind citizens. They accepted her into the course and accepted her fees and were then obliged to provide the materials for her to use in a form in which she could use them. There's also the case of the drive through bank, which is common in Canada and the US. Think of snow up to your armpits and you'd rather not get out of the car. They were fined because their teller machine in the drive through wasn't accessible. The bank assumed a blind person wouldn't be driving. While that is certainly likely and true, they hadn't thought of the taxi passenger who needed the taxi to stop at the bank machine on the way to the airport. That passenger would need to give their PIN and their ATM card to the cab driver. And who knows if they would get their card back and not some random card. And if the taxi driver would withdraw additional funds and keep some for his or her own personal use. Security, privacy issues here, such as David mentioned. So what role should ethics play in IT? Would you be happy with your accountant not having verified credentials? What about your lawyer or your doctor? Personally, I expect that professionals I contract for services possess the right credentials to do the job and to take care of my interests. I think all of you here consider yourselves to be professionals, but what verifiable credentials do you possess? Has anyone checked them and made sure that they're relevant? I'm not saying that you don't have credentials. Many of you have loads of credentials. But is the consumer checking and are the credentials required for the professional association in the industry? Organizations such as the Australian Computer Society have a program of professional development and verified credentials. For ACS, they're the levels of certified technician, certified professional, certified professional senior and fellow. There is a rigorous process of review and validation of qualifications. And you have the opportunity to use the letter and association to show that ethics and standards are important to you. However, this is voluntary. In accounting, engineering, legal, medicine, unverified credentials are not optional. Organizations have professional standards too, which are again optional. For example, the Australian Computer Society, the Australian Web Industry Association, and the World Wide Web Consortium. Even in these organizations, is there a clear statement of the importance of diversity digital accessibility and inclusivity? Does the organization or individual display some kind of statement for the client that states their aspirations and strategy for achievement and how the consumer can hold them accountable? As Sir Tim Berners-Lee, inventor of the web states, the power of the web is in its universality. Aspect by everyone regardless of disability is an essential aspect. What are we doing now? Every now and again, I manage, not surprising to some people, to make myself a little unpopular by stating that we need to look for certification and validation of credentials for those offering services affecting information access for users. After all, a pharmacist must have credentials to even sell us a prescription written by our doctor because he also provides us advice about how that medicine is used and its possible interactions. IT practitioners provide advice and services, but it seems anyone can offer any service they like, and there's no professional education required along the way. 
did you know that there is no Australian-based accreditation for an accessibility professional? Anyone can state that's what they are and no one can check because there's no definition and no standard. How can we do better? My personal views. Ensure that we're keeping up our professional development. Ensure that we're part of a certification scheme and have our credentials verified. verified. Understand the rules and the regulations. Think of the policeman who stops you for driving at 100 kilometers an hour in a 60 kilometer zone. Would he accept your excuse that you didn't know the speed limit? If you're driving the car, you are responsible to know the rules. The same should apply in our industry. If we're offering services, we should know, respect, and use the rules. Suggest ensure that your organization has clearly stated ethical goals, mission statements, and preferably joins professional organization to promote better standards. Educate users on their rights to ask the difficult questions and how to make a complaint. Everyone has a right to access information. For example, does your website has a con have a contact number or email for people who are experiencing difficulty using it? Most importantly, we can assure ensure that we're providing services that are accessible by as many users as possible in the best way possible using the best products possible. Know your user and then your potential user and even those who do, you don't anticipate right now would be your user. People don't have disabilities. We all have a unique set of abilities and capabilities that we either are born with or develop over time. We disable others by putting stumbling blocks in their paths, such as poor design. We can do so much better. For me and for WebKey, the issue is not about disability. It's about accessibility. Accessibility matters. Ethics matter. Together, let's unlock the web. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Are there any questions here in the room for Vivian? No, no questions. Um, any questions online on Zoom? I'm not supposed to make it so easy for her. <laughs> I don't mind. Uh, I mean, make it easy for her. All right. Um, look, I'm just going to do a couple of closing remarks. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to take a moment and say thank you to all of our guest speakers um, and our host today, which was ECU um, in this beautiful room, which looks like, um, those of you who can't see it, it looks like a UN board table. It's just incredibly intimidating and I'm enjoying sitting at the head of it. I'm not going to lie. Um, thank you to everyone for coming along and supporting this new chapter and the incredible work that W3C is doing and this journey that we're taking here in the Western region. And while I have your attention, um, I'd like to mention the upcoming W3C technical plenary meetings in October. Unfortunately, um, it's not particularly time zone friendly for us Aussies, but if you would like to be invited to observe, get in touch with me um, and we can make that opportunity happen. It's a really good opportunity um, and to see the inner workings of W3C working groups um, and to um, have an idea of what they do at W3C. Um, I'd also like to make a special mention, and because accessibility is my space, I'm, I'm going to mention it, is that the W3C edX course on accessibility looks to be ending this month. So get in while you can. It's a fantastic introductory course. Um, and if you haven't taken it, I suggest you do it. It's really, really good. Uh, finally, over the coming months, I'm going to be reaching out to you and anyone who will have a listen for what kind of events you want to see out of this chapter office, what resources, ideas you have. I'm teeing up right now um, a virtual event soon with our sister chapter on the East Coast. Um, and hopefully I'll have some information about that really soon, but um, it may be, uh, it's likely to be geared towards W3C members and there's a few in the room today. So um, I'll probably be getting in touch with you very soon about, about this um, and getting your ideas about what it looks like going forward. Um, if you're not already on the chapter's mailing list and you'd like to be, so that's for events, any news, we're looking at developing a newsletter, please drop me a line and we'll sort you out and get you on there. And I think that's it for me today. Look, thank you everyone. Please stay safe. It's um, unnerving world out there right now. 
And um, yeah, thank you for attending. Thanks, Amanda. Thank God. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bye. Thanks, Amanda. Bye bye. All right. Thank you, Amanda. See you. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Amanda. It was wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks, Natalie. Fantastic. I missed a lot, but pretty good. Thank you for what I did see. Good luck. We supported it, Liddy, so I'll send it around. Oh, fantastic. Because, I, yeah, I couldn't do the early part, but it's, it's really fun. I, it takes me back to think of how much work has gone into getting to this point. Good on you guys. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to close the room now. Thank you so much for joining us.